Welcome to the stream. My name is Dr. Rachel Tapman, and uh, my stream is for anybody who cares about language technology and other people, and it looks like it is working. Uh, and I'm sorry that I am late today, but <laughs> uh, story time, not something I usually do on my channel, but in this case, I think it's relevant. So I usually change uh, before stream just so like, you know, I'm not wearing my gardening and uh, puttering around the house clothes. Um, and today I was, you know, getting clothes from laundry and I was like, oh, something crinkly in there. It must be, you know, a candy wrapper. No, it was a cicada. It was a full ass cicada. Voila. So I'll, it's alive. <laughs> not doing great, but definitely alive. Um, so I'm just gonna, Pop it outside uh, the window. And that's been my morning. Hello, hopefully yours has been less filled with surprise bugs. Come on, bud. They're getting towards the end of their season here in beautiful Virginia. Which means uh, they are starting to die off. Come on, bud. How'd you get? Rescue mission. Here you go. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Eh? Yeah. How'd you get? No, not on my finger. Out the window. All right. <laughs> um, and that's my dog running to save us all. Anyway, um, I don't mind cicadas. They're not an issue for me, but uh, that's why I was late to stream this morning. So, what are we going to do on stream? Oh, uh, also it's in a podcast format now, so for those of you who are listening, uh, I showed you the cicada. It was a pretty green one. Oh my god, excuse me. Oh, it never rains but it pours, huh? And on that extremely chaotic note, let's get started. I'm going to take a little sip of coffee. Um... So on stream, we usually talk about uh, a number of things in order, starting with research, which we will do. We'll talk about research. Uh, and then we'll talk about just practical stuff. So like job announcements, um, you know, uh, the libraries that I've come across that I thought might be useful for folks, that kind of stuff. And then we will talk about uh, politics. So um, in this case, we've just got some like court cases. It's very US focused today. Sorry about that. That just happens to be uh, <laughs> what happened there. Uh, Matt says, now my favorite podcast. Oh, thank you. Uh, oh, I'm glad I could introduce some uh, cicada themed uh, surprises into your morning. Uh, and then we'll talk about ethics, like we always do. And this is usually like news stories, um, stuff that's come up, uh, different projects. Um, and then we end on a little bit of a, a high note with some just some fun things, some little jokes, um, just so it's not all bummers all the time. Nobody likes that. All right, let's get started with the research. All right, uh, so, oh, let me just this quite slightly. So this paper, uh, the paper itself is not available yet, but it has been accepted. Um, so we're about to start seeing the EMNLP papers. EMNLP is Empirical Methods in Natural Language Processing. It's one of the big Association for Computational Linguistics or ACL conferences. So it's one of the main publication venues for um, NLP, which means that we're about to see a whole bunch of papers. And this one I think is fabulous. Um, I really like the, I'm a huge fan of the work that um, I think it said Mascane. Uh, feel free to correct me if you are uh, more familiar with the, the correct pronunciation. Um, research group has been doing. Uh, it's, you know, African researchers working on African languages, uh, which is a huge need, uh, and I think really should be done by the people who are being impacted with the, you know, financial and material support of uh, uh, the people who have the money. Maybe they have the money because they took it from, from those people. Hmm. Anyway, at some point in the past. Uh, and the uh, paper that was accepted, and the code is available, uh, which is why I'm, I'm sharing it now, uh, is uh, the Mascaneer <laughs> 2.0, which is M-A-S-A-K-H-A-N-E-R, named entity recognition 2.0, um, which covers, you know, more languages uh, and is now available on GitHub. 
Uh, and this tweet is from David. This is tonal. I do not know uh, the tones, so I'm really gonna butcher this. I think it's Yoruba, and I'm uh, I'm sorry in advance, but uh, I think it's Ife Olua. Uh, Adelani. Again, apologies. Please feel free to correct me. I do know uh, the international phonetic alphabet, so I'm happy to take the uh, the IPA. Uh, who is at D A V L A N A D E on Twitter, uh, and there are a bunch of co-authors on this paper um, who are all um, you know written here. I think it looks like probably uh, 2030. Um, uh, and they also, uh, David shouts out the Lacuna Fund for supporting the creation of this data set. So, uh, good job, <laughs> Lacuna Fund. Uh, and big congrats to the team for getting this paper submitted. It sounds like it was uh, an extremely large amount of work. Um, and the uh, the sort of the big data set and contribution is this NER data set. Uh, I'm reading from the paper now. We create the largest human annotated NER data set for 20 African languages, and we study the behavior of state-of-the-art cross-lingual transfer methods in an Africa-centric setting, demonstrating that the choice of source language significantly affects the performance. So if you have a multilingual model, um, what the sort of main languages in the multilingual model is going to affect things significantly. And also they have this really rich human annotated, human annotated data set, extremely high quality from this great research group. So congrats to them. I look forward to reading the full paper when the proceedings come out. All right. Uh, next up is a preprint. We've got a bunch of preprints. Um, again, the EMNLP proceedings haven't come out yet. Uh, people are just sort of announcing what's been accepted. Uh, and this one came across my uh, purview, I guess, <laughs> in front of my eyeballs. Uh, and the paper is Neural Networks and the Chomsky Hierarchy. Chomsky is C-H-O-M-S-K-Y. Um, he is a linguist and computer scientist. Um, very old, but still alive, last I heard. And I believe he's at the University of Arizona now, sort of at a emeritus level and sort of popping in every so often to talk about stuff. Um, by I'm going to anglicize this. Uh, it is spelled G-R-E accent Eku, G-O-I-R-E. Uh, and then the last name is D-E-L-E accent Eku, T-A-N-G. Um, Gregory Delatang, probably Gregoire Delatang, apologies, is the first author. Uh, and then uh, many <laughs> additional authors, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten additional authors, um, who I am not all going to read, uh, but know that this is the first author among ten other ones. Uh, and so the, the Chomsky hierarchy. Um, do they have like a quick little summary in here? I can just read because it has been a while since I had to uh, talk about this. Well, they have a visualization, which is not going to be as helpful for those of you who are listening to the podcast, but I'll do my best. Um, so figure one, I'm reading the caption now, formal language classes and their correspondence with neural language architectures. Uh, left, our empirical evaluation locates the architectures on the hierarchy of formal language classes. Right, each formal language class is associated with a minimal computational model, automaton, to generate the language, see section three. Um, so if you've studied like finite state automata, this is them. Uh, all automata have a finite state controller at their core, in addition to increasingly restrictive memory access as we descend the hierarchy. So, oh, I am, now that I realize that I have to voice interpret this figure, suddenly extremely uh, <laughs> uh, filled with regret. Um, so it's um, a set of stacked circles where each circle includes all of the previous circles. The uh, smallest circle is finite, uh, which they uh, say corresponds to feed forward networks and transformers. Uh, the circle that includes finite is regular, which they say includes uh, recurrent neural networks. The, stack, the circle above that is deterministic deterministic context-free, uh, which they uh, correlate to stack RNNs. Uh, the one above that is context-sensitive, which they um, 
relate to tape RNNs, which I don't think I've actually ever heard of before, uh, a tape recurrent neural network. Hello, Michaelilla. Uh, welcome, welcome. Uh, and then the, the biggest circle is recursively enumerable, which they don't have a um, uh, architecture that they relate it to. Uh, although it is, there's also a second half to this figure I'm getting there. Um, related to infinite tape. And then there is a smaller circle that subsects some of the circles. Specifically, it completely encloses regular and finite uh, and intersects with determinist deterministic, context-free, and context-sensitive, but does not intersect with recursively enumerable. Um, and that circle is counter, uh, and the architecture that is related to that is LSTM, um, which is a form of RNA. N, which is probably why RNN is completely within it, which is uh, a type of feed for all neural network, which is probably why feed for all why that is also contained completely within it. I hope I'm doing an okay job and you can follow here. Um, and then there's also a um, second half to the figure, which relates these. Um, so the things in bold are parts of the Chomsky hierarchy. The unbolded uh, neural network architecture underneath them are the architectures that they say each relates to. Um, and then they also have a data structure for each of those. So for the LSTM counters, they have a counter data structure. For the deterministic, context-free, deterministic, uh, context-free, they have that related to a stack. Um, for the tape RNN, they have that related to a tape. And for that largest recursively enumerable that doesn't have a um, data, a, sorry, a model class associated with it, they associate that with infinite tape. Uh, and all of those data structures uh, are related to a finite state controller, so can be represented with uh, you know, a finite state automata. So basically, the uh, contribution of this paper, which is, wow, this is really gritty, uh, you know, linguistics uh, and also a lot of machine learning theory, um, is to say the different types of um, generative processes that can be captured in this Chomsky hierarchy relate to different model architectures. Uh, and basically, the more stuff <laughs> you add to the model architecture, the more able it is to capture um, a more complex generative structure, right? So um, a feed-forward feed neural network can only capture like a finite set of things. Uh, regular language uh, can be captured with an RNN. Um, with the sort of historical trend here being moving from the less complex architectures to the more complex architectures, right? So an RNN has more going on than just a feed-forward feed forward neural network. A stack RNN has additional state stuff. Um, again, I'm not familiar with these tape and RNNs. Um, and LSTM, again, has additional stuff, um, specifically a the long short-term memory, right? It's got a forget gate. Um, with the exception of uh, the finite bubble, which is the smallest one, which is related to the feed forward neural network, also includes the transformer architecture, which is sort of the one that people are probably most excited about these days. Um, and their argument here, I would say, is that uh, transformers are unable to capture the generative qualities of things like uh, context sensitive or deterministic context free grammar. Um, is the idea there. So that is the uh, general um, claim that they are making. Um, yep. <laughs> uh, and it is currently under review. And this this feels like a, maybe an ICML paper, uh, if I had to guess. Uh, I didn't actually check open review. I guess I could have. Um, but that is uh, the second paper, which I just thought was interesting. Um, there was there was a time in the not too distant past where arguing about different classes of generative grammars and you know their um, qualities and which one made the most sense for different NLP tasks was a big thing in uh, NLP, and I would say it's no longer sort of the main research direction that the field as a whole is interested in. But people are definitely still working on it. So um, interesting paper. Um, I'll be interested to see what else comes out of here. Um, and I'm also really interested to see how the people who are, you know, historically and probably currently are working on these sort of Chomskyan uh, models of generativity in a computational sense um, deal with it.
<sighs> All right, moving on. Uh, oh, right, so this uh, is actually a little bit of an older paper. So it was, it's on archive. Um, it is a preprint. I don't believe it's ever been published. Uh, and it was submitted on August 4th, August, August 4th, 2021. And it was last revised November 28th, 2021. Uh, the paper is Mitigating Harm in Language Models with Conditional Likelihood Filtration. Uh, and the co-authors of whom there are seven, I think. Uh, the first author is Helen Go, uh, and Go. So if you're interested in checking that out, uh, but this, somebody actually sent me this paper this week, uh, and I believe all or some of the authors are at Cohere. One, two, three. Yes, all of the authors are at Cohere, um, and the corresponding authors are the first author, uh, Helen Go, and then the last author, Nicholas Frost. Um, that is F R O S S T. Um, I wonder if that is a last name that that person has chosen and constructed given their love of open source software. I don't know that that's true, but that would be uh, a cool last name to uh, make up if you really loved open source. And what I thought was really interesting about this paper, um, I'll just read the abstract. Um, and then I'll, I'll sort of pick out the things that I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Um, language models trained on large scale unfiltered data sets curated from the open web acquire systemic biases, uh, prejudices and harmful views from their training data, um, which I think this is not a controversial statement, right? Um, there's a lot of heat, hate speech online and uh, a lot of models get trained with it intentionally or unintentionally. Um, and I would say we have eh, <laughs> we have some methods that work okay for English for removing hate speech, and that's a big focus of this model. Um, but particularly once you move out of the English context, um, it's just it's even less of a solved problem than it is in English. And I would say that it is not solved in English, so definitely uh, a challenge. Uh, <laughs> We present a methodology for programmatically identifying and removing harmful text from web scale data sets. A pre-trained language model is used to obsess, uh, assess with an A, uh, the log likelihood of researcher written trigger phrases conditioned on a specific document, which is used to identify and filter documents from the data set. Uh, so this is the thing that I found particularly interested, uh, particularly interesting. So basically what they're doing is uh, they already have a language model, right? So a pre-trained language model. Uh, and then they are trying to find the log likelihood, which um, that's the, the log of the likelihood, right? <laughs> um, which was uh, at one point an extremely common measure in uh, you know NLP in general. Um, you, st you still see it some, but I feel like it's, uh, it's just a little bit less common now than it was, but it's very useful. Um, and then this is the bit that really caught my attention of researcher written trigger phrases. Oh, wow. Researcher written trigger phrases conditioned on a specific document, right? So you have uh, uh, trigger phrases, which, you know, building on that research that we talked about a couple times are, um, you know, uh, intended to produce, um, you know, harmful text usually, but you can, you know, they can be fine tuned for any sort of, uh, uh, task that you're looking for, um, conditioned on a specific document, right? So they have an example of the sort of thing that they want to remove. Uh, and then they use that to identify and filter documents from the data set, right? So, um, uh, more fuzzy and probabilistic than something like using keyword detection, basically. We demonstrate that models trained on this filtered data set exhibit lower propensity to generate harmful text with a marginal decrease in performance on standard language modeling benchmarks compared to unfiltered baselines. So this technique for removing data uh, really reduces the amount of you know bad stuff the model puts out, but it doesn't really hurt performance that much. Uh, we provide a partial explanation for the performance gap by surfacing examples of hate speech and other undesirable content from standard language modeling benchmarks. They're saying, hey, you know, the additional uh, boost that the standard, you know, uh, models are getting are because standard language modeling benchmarks straight up include hate speech. So if your model can't handle hate speech uh, and it's included in these benchmarks, 
it's just not going to do as well. Finally, we discussed the generalization of this method and how trigger phrases reflecting specific values can be used by researchers to build language models which are more closely aligned with their values. Um, and of course, you know, any sort of general method like this could also be used for, say, censorship to make sure that language models don't discuss, you know, um, for example, in a state censorship situation, politically sensitive topics, uh, but can also be used for, for harm mitigation and reducing the amount of content that's generated that is, you know, hate speech in particular. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, an interesting approach, um, a more, you know, um, uh, certainly fuzzier and a little bit more flexible than keyword-based approaches. Um, and uh, just to talk about what trigger phrases are, we define trigger phrases as a succinct statement of the rhetoric we aim to remove. Uh, so they have an example uh, that is emblematic of modern white supremacist rhetoric. I'm not going to read it. Uh, documents are removed from the corpus if their conditional log likelihood is high when the trigger phrase is appended. Right. So basically what they're doing is they're like, hey, we're trying to figure out if this you know, potentially could be hate speech. So we um, have the phrase with it and without it. Uh, and we are trying to see, you know, is it very likely, given this language model, because uh, remember, language models are models of the likeliness of a span of text, um, are these two things occurring together very likely or are they not very likely, right? So if I have like a gardening guide, for example, and I'm like, make sure to soak your carrot seeds for 24 hours before you plant them to ensure germination, white supremacist rhetoric, right? That would be very surprising. <laughs> the likelihood of those, um, you know, particular things occurring together is assuming that most gardening blogs are not full of hate speech, very low, given the training data prevented, provided to the model. Um, but if I have, you know, um, for example, something like, uh, the government's horrible and we should overthrow them because white supremacists hate speech. Uh, and if that had, those things were very likely to occur together, then it's poss probable that, you know, hate speech would occur elsewhere in this document. Um, is sort of their, their general idea there. Um, uh, <sighs> A little bit more. Uh, documents are removed from their corpus. I'm reading here. If their conditional log likelihood is high with the trigger phrase offended, appended, A P P E N D E D, we demonstrate that models trained on the resulting data sets are less likely to generate harmful text by measuring the maximum toxicity of their sample scores. Samples are scored by the perspective API, so using a commercial off the shelf toxicity detection. Uh, conditional likelihood filtration can be used in conjunction with a narrower block list. So this is just like a dictionary of banned words to minimize undesirable content in the corpus while retaining expository context and counter speech. Um, so counter speech is speech against hate speech, right? So like if I'm like, hey, you shouldn't call people mean names, uh, right? Or if I replace mean names with an actual mean name, that's not hate speech, right? If I'm saying like, hey, you shouldn't call someone a bitch, that's counter speech against someone who is, you know, depending on the context, potentially doing hate speech. Um, and you don't want to remove that, right? Like that's something that perhaps you would want your model to generate uh, is counter speech. The generability, reading again, the generalizability of their model uh, allows for it to be run iteratively with new trigger phases to capture emergent forms of unwanted rhetoric. Um, so uh, I think an interesting approach, I do like that they are uh, focused on the data set itself and removing, uh, using a novel method to remove data uh, and particularly to sort of, um, if you think of, you know, your training corpus like a watermelon, a multi-dimensional watermelon. So imagine a 10th dimensional watermelon. No one has 10th dimensional vectors. Um, but you can imagine, you know, your training vector space is a three-dimensional space that's like a watermelon. Um, and you look in, you know, you cut, you, you're slicing through the watermelon, you're looking at it and you're like, ah, I see here, there's a little pocket of wa rotten watermelon. I don't want this in my fruit salad slash trained language model. Um, so this method allows them to sort of like scoop out the rotten bit of the watermelon and then make the fruit salad as opposed to making the fruit salad with rotten watermelon and then trying to like somehow filter after the fruit salad's been made. Just a, a little uh, <laughs> hopefully helpful uh, a description of why this might be a little bit easier than doing, um, you know, mitigation, say, at the prompting stage. Uh, but anyway, interesting approach. Um, I don't think I'd seen it before. Um, uh, yeah.
a little bit of an older paper, but still, I think, good to talk about. Uh, we have another preprint as well. So I just ran across this and actually uh, I didn't see it on archive yet on a, on a quick search. So I think it may be quite, quite recent. Um, but again, preprint has not been published. And there are two uh, first authors on this. The paper is Multilingual Bert Has an Accent, Evaluating English Influences on Fluency in Multilingual Models. Uh, and the two false first authors are uh, Isabel... Papa Dimitriou, again, apologies if I say anybody's name wrong, it's never my intention, uh, and Kezia Lopez, uh, and then third author Dan Jarafsky from Stanford, all of them. Uh, and this, I think, is uh, a little bit of an under-researched area. So a big issue with languages that have, with multilingual models that start with um, a big model in a specific language and then sort of like add additional stuff. Um, most of the big transformer models trained on, on lots of web scrapings. Hi, I am. Welcome, welcome. Uh, is that they tend to work okay for English and there's a long tail of how well they work for other languages. Um, they work extremely poorly for some languages usually, um, which is not great. Obviously for people who are trying to use the models. Um, yeah, and this, any sort of massively multilingual project I think Common Voice is a good exception here, right? So Common Voice is a, um, or, you know, Koki, which is, uh, has a lot of the original Common Voice team members in it as well. Uh, if you have, you know, researchers at a, uh, I'm adjusting things, um, at a centralized hub and they are, you know, uh, predominantly or all English speakers and are predominantly or all working in English and then they're like, hey, we're going to add a bunch of other languages. My experience of that type of uh, project tends to be that the other language's model quality doesn't seem to be particularly good and I have formed that impression from talking for people who are trying to use the non-English parts of the model. Um, is it better than anything else that's available for that language currently? I don't know, question mark. Maybe yes, maybe no. Um, I think that varies on a language by language basis. Um, the difference there with something like uh, Common Voice or Koki is that the language data that's being gathered is being gathered by the various language communities um, and is really being done in a, in a data donor sort of framework. So, um, but if you don't, you know, if you are building, let's say, an English and Spanish model and you have a lot of folks on your team who are, you know, very familiar with Spanish or fluent speakers of Spanish or maybe native speakers of Spanish, um, and they are, you know, providing that perspective and it's an equal um, focus of your team along with English, you're probably going to get a pretty good model for Spanish. Uh, but if nobody on your team, you know, knows or speaks Spanish and you don't spend a lot of time carefully collecting data in Spanish and evaluating it, um, you probably aren't going to end up with a great Spanish model. Right, a you know, just sort of something that happens. Uh, and here they are uh, looking at because it's a multilingual model, right? So it's trained on multiple languages. The uh, sort of center of gravity of English on these other languages and how much it is pulling, you know, the output of the other languages towards English like output. So the basic process that they're looking at, uh, I'm going to zoom in on a figure here. This is figure one, uh, reading the caption is what that's called. Woo. One more, one second, more coffee. Our method for evaluating English structural bias in multilingual models. We compare monolingual and multilingual model predictions on two sets of natural sentences in the target language, one which is structurally parallel to English, one which is not. Um, so basically, they have um, they have a monolingual model, they have a multilingual model. Uh, the monolingual model is uh, not the I'm trying to figure out which language the multilingual, the monolingual model is trained on. Is it trained on English or is it trained on the target language? Mm -mm -mm. One sec, let me read the abstract because that's not entirely clear to me. Uh, da, da, da. I'm just uh, scrolling through the abstract now. 
Oh, sorry. (laughs) I'm going to read that sentence and I'll tell you why I made that face and sound. Uh, Well, multilingual language models can improve NLP performance on low resource languages by leveraging high resource languages. Uh, So basically you have, you know, a terabyte of English data and a megabyte of Thai data. Um, Can the English data help the Thai data? Uh, They also reduce average performance on all languages, the curse of multilinguality. Um, So this is, of course, parallel to the uh, the curse of multidimensionality, where as you have you know more dimensions you need more data to get achieve um you know similar power um i just hate that phrasing <laughs> um maybe that's a standard phrasing for working on multilingual models but it makes it sound like um working with multiple languages is inherently bad and worse um and you know, we've talked about this on the channel before, most humans speak multiple languages. To be a monolingual speaker of something is uh, both ahistorically and globally kind of weird and unusual. Um, And often, I won't say always, but often the result of uh, imperialism. Again, just sort of looking at at population level trends. Uh, I'm going to continue to read this if we can see if we can get something uh, answer my question that I had earlier. Uh, Here we show another problem with multilingual models. Grammatical structures in higher resource languages bleed into lower resource languages. I'm guessing here they mean syntactic when they say grammatical structures, Uh, a phenomena we call grammatical structure bias. Um, So for example, I don't think they're saying that like, um, hey, English doesn't have grammatical gender. So if you try to generate, you know, a grammatically gendered language with it, you're going to get ungendered a version of it somehow. I think they're specifically talking about syntax. We show this via, uh, via novel method for comparing the fluency of multilinguals to the fluency of monolingual Spanish and Greek models. Okay, so they're comparing uh, a monolingual model on the target language compared to a multilingual model that also includes English data. Got it. Uh, Ravi says, have I ever tried BERT in my project? I've never you know, been in a place where I've found a need for it. Um, humans can do multilingual stuff. Computers can't. I mean, they can. Um, it's just not uh, people's priority, right? Da, da, da. Uh, OK, so they have two uh, carefully chosen variable grammatical structures, optional pronoun drop in Spanish, and optional subject verb ordering in Greek. Um, we find that multilingual BERT is biased towards the English-like setting, explicit pronouns, and subject verb object ordering as compared to our monolingual control. Okay, so basically what they're saying here is that there are um, some grammatical structures, syntactic structures, which can vary. Um, so you can do things multiple ways in Spanish and in Greek, but you can only do things one way in English. Uh, and if you're using a multilingual model, they're going to, uh, they're much more likely to recommend the way that we do things in English. So these particular things. Uh, pronoun drop, also called pro drop, uh, is when you do not include the pronoun in a sentence, right? So I think a probably well-known example of this, even among English speakers, is uh, soy Dora, right? So like when Dora says soy Dora, she is saying M Dora, if we're sort of glossing it, right? Uh, if she was including the pronoun, she would say yo soy Dora, I am Dora. Um, it is optional in Spanish um, because it's redundant information because it's encoded in the, um, you know, conjunction of the verb. Conjunction, conjugation, my God, how many linguistics degrees do I have? Uh, so it's much more common in Spanish. In English, uh, it's ungrammatical to do pro drop, right? So people don't really do it. Um, you may have really marginal uh, examples. By marginal here, I mean very rare and unusual. So something like straining. Um, right, where you don't have an it, <laughs> but you have the s from the contraction it's. Uh, again, very rare, um, Not oh, probably not something somebody would write down as well, very informal. Um, you may or may not have some examples of that in English. Um, Nine says, do they study about a model where languages of the same family are used? Uh, so Spanish and English are actually fairly closely related, not like, uh, not like German and English. German and English are very closely related, um, but they're both uh, 
relatively similar. Uh, and also specifically with Romance languages, um, English is arguably a Creole. Uh, I'm not going to get too deep into that, but English has certainly had a large amount of contact with and borrowing from uh, specifically Norman French, which is also a Romance language. So even though English is Germanic language in its topology, it does have a lot of overlap with uh, Latinate languages, right? So um, and one way that you can really see that is that we have a lot of sort of uh, repeated vocabulary words, right? So um, uh, a common example here, so the names of animals and also the, the meat of that animal, right? So the meat of deer is venison, the meat of cattle is beef, the meat of... Um, Some of them don't do it, right? Like the meat of fish is just fish. <laughs> uh, uh, the meat of uh, lamb is mutton, where the animal, right, deer, lamb, uh, cow, comes from the Germanic root, and then the meat comes from the, um, you know, Latinate root, right? So uh, beef, boeuf in French, uh, mutton, mouton, which I think is lamb? I think that's lamb or sheep in, in French. Um, I don't actually know what venison is in French, but I imagine it's very similar to venison in, in English. Uh, so even though English and Spanish are not, you know, typologically that closely related to both Indo-European, um, they do have English and Latin languages, Latin based languages, derived languages do tend to have quite a bit of vocabulary overlap, um, which specifically when you're looking at prodrop isn't like as important, but just something to know. Uh, and then Greek is pretty unrelated to English. So uh, Greek is Hellenic um, and the sort of the Greek languages are a little bit of an isolate. Uh, I'm just going to look and see because I don't remember off the top of my head uh, whether or not um, uh, Greek itself is Indo-European. I want to say it is, but I have been wrong before. Okay, it is Indo-European, um, but it is Hellenic. I don't believe there are any other existing Hellenic languages. Uh, here's a fun fact. Ancient Greek was tonal. Uh, so all the sort of like ancient Greek ballads, uh, you know, that you may be familiar with were originally uh, had tones. Isn't that interesting? I love languages. Da, da, da. In most classifications, Hellenic consists of Greek alone. Uh, and some people say that it includes other potential varieties uh, of ancient languages. So uh, Greek is more unlike English than Spanish is, I would argue, uh, given historical uh, language contact between uh, a language that's very closely related to Spanish, French, and English. Wow, that was a, uh, <laughs> I'm in the mood of sometimes when you have a professor and you're like, I don't really want to do what class is on today. I'm just going to ask them questions. Uh, and I know that they're going to get distracted. I'm in that very distractible mood. Anyway, uh, so we talked about pro drop. Uh, so in uh, Greek, it sounds like you have, I'm less familiar with Greek than I am with Spanish, uh, some variability in do, 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 whether you do the uh, subject or the verb first. So I'm now looking at table one, which are various examples. Um, okay, so yes, yeah, so you can put the subject before or after the verb. Um, English is very famously pretty rigid about having um, subject, verb, object, um, you know, ordering of grammatical structures. Uh, and basically the verb is the, the verb, it's a part of speech. Um, and the subject is the thing in the sentence, um, which if you change its grammatical properties, the verb will agree with. That's the easiest way to think about the subject. Um, Cause people will be like, oh, it's the, the subject is what's doing the doing in the sentence. But a lot of times, you know, uh, in something like, there is a cicada in my laundry, uh, there is the subject there, um, but there is doing nothing, right? It's just sort of holding the grammatically place, uh, holding the grammatical place, uh, and then the verb is agreeing with that. Uh, 
English is very rigid about its syntactic word order, um, in part a sort of a trade-off because we don't tend to have a lot of grammatical agreement. Uh, and it looks like Greek, which has, I'm guessing, more grammatical agreement, things are a lot more fuzzy. But if you're having a multilingual model, instead of a monolingual model, it's going to be pulled towards those sort of Englishy constructions, uh, so not having the verb before the subject uh, and not having the, the pro job. So, uh, Interesting subject, interesting study. Uh, those error bars are a little bit overlappy. Uh, we find that uh, the monolingual model is significantly smaller than the multilingual model when it comes to whether or not it will pro drop. Uh, P equals 0 0.5. Hmm. How many samples were you looking at? Uh, this seems like a fairly fuzzy effect looking at the, at that, just looking at this mod, this, uh, figure, which is figure two. Uh, it's even smaller in Greek. So peak, peak uh, less than 0 0.5, oh, sorry, 0 0.05 is pretty common in the behavioral sciences where it's hard to get a large number of subjects. Uh, but in this case, they, uh, are looking at... Uh, models, which they can just ask things of all day. So I'm wondering if they will tell us how many uh, actual samples they did. I don't see anything. Okay, so yeah, it's an interesting uh, experiment. It's an interesting paper. I don't think it's bad work, but I am a little bit mm, skeptical about the uh power here, the statistical power, uh, given their claims. Natural sentences, cannot artificially, blah, 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 yes, yes, yes. How many samples did you have? Encoder only, no canonical, mm -hmm. da, da, da. function, yes, okay, case study. Yes, corpora. Okay, so they extracted the corpora from the Spanish GSD tree bank from the Universal Dependencies data set. Uh, okay, so they had... Ah, these are very unbalanced sentences. So they had 283 sentences in the parallel condition and 2,656 2, in the different position. So given that sample size, granted it is very, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, it was very imbalanced. I feel like that power is maybe a little bit low. And then for the other one, uh, and this is for Greek, uh, they collected 1,400 in the parallel condition and 425 in the different condition. Um, yeah. I think it's interesting. I think it's a good result. I am slightly unconvinced uh, by the power. Um, Anyway, so that is the preprint. Uh, perhaps it will get published, perhaps not. I would probably want to see, um, again, uh, more. I would, I would like to see a larger data set, and I would like to see a different data set and see if it obtains on the uh, out of fold data. Do, do, do. Uh, Robbie says Greeks are great mathematicians. Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, certainly very important in the history of math. Uh, yeah. All right. Next up. Uh, oh, I have no background for this at all, besides sort of knowing how multi um, matrix multiplication works. I had to think about that. Uh, but this is a press release out of DeepMind. Um, discovering novel algorithms with alpha tensor uh, and basically they are you know these are results from a um model <laughs> uh, and they found um da -da -da, the model is called alpha tensor i'm reading here the first artificial intelligence system ai
So, sorry, I read artificial intelligence in parentheses AI, and I had a moment of confusion, and I was like, is that really how people abbreviate it? Isn't it usually IA? Isn't that the normal way that people talk about it? It is not. <laughs> I work in this field. I do have dyslexia, uh, and sometimes um, the way that I like to describe it is that when I am reading, uh, very unlikely things are presented to me as the most likely thing, right? So it's like my language model is broken if I were uh, an NLP system. Um, I wouldn't say broken, but um, great example of the my brain just like being uh, incorrect about how surprising it labeled something as. Uh, the first AI system for discovering uh, novel, efficient, and pro provably correct algorithms for fundamental tasks such as matrix multiplication. Um, so basically there's a new method for matrix multiplication that was discovered by Alpha Tensor. Um, cool. Uh, and the thing that is sort of exciting is that it is um, much more efficient. So um, perhaps obviously, uh, Anything using deep learning requires a lot of matrix multiplication and tensor multiplication, uh, and here they can do it in a uh, new, more efficient way, which is great. It's going to save us all uh, time and money, so very big fun fan of that. Uh, uh, and this is from the blog post. Because matrix multiplication is a core component in many computational tasks, spanning computer gra graphics, digital communications, neural network training, and scientific computing, alpha tensor discovered algorithms could make computations in these fields significantly more efficient. So kind of cool. Um, I know that I am, um, you know, sometimes a little bit skeptical of DeepMind, but this seems like a cool finding that uh, I'm happy to see I love smaller, more efficient things, uh, and it sounds like this is uh, definitely more efficient. So good job, people who worked on this. Uh, and like I said, I don't have the, the background to be able to tell you that like, ah, uh, yes, this is the good proofs machine, uh, not, not really my area of expertise, but uh, it seems cool. Uh, speaking of my area of expertise, so this is, uh, also a preprint. It's formatted using the ACM uh, formatting thing, so I'm guessing it's been submitted, uh, but I can't really find any more information about this. It just sort of like, again, I just sort of ran across it. Uh, Robbie says, instead of dyslinguist, I've done a PhD in language uh, or in a language. Um, I mean, I'm not super good at language learning on account of the dyslexia, so um, that seems like not a, a great choice for me and my happiness, but... Uh, so this paper is a preprint, uh, and the title is From Plane Crashes to Algorithmic Harn, Applicability of Safety Engineering Frameworks for Responsible ML. Um, and it has seven authors, and the first author is Shalela Rasmani uh, from Google Research, McGill University, Canada. Uh, and then there's a bunch of um, authors and their affiliations are mostly Google, uh, the Naval Postgraduate School, uh, and McGill, which is in Canada. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's fine. It's just, um, sorry, Robbie said, sorry for dyslexia. Um, I have learned to live with it. It's just how my brain works. There's nothing I can do about it. Um, and one nice thing about being a linguist is that I can sort of describe and uh, notice when uh, my brain's doing fun things and tell you all about them. All right. Uh, so something that I've, you know, talked about quite a bit is the, you know, capacity for general machine learning stuff to do harm. Um, you know, we talk about it every week in the ethics section. Um, and I really come to that from usually a framing of a research ethics perspective, because that's what my background's in. Um, and also, 
I think this is a difference between um, NLP and other fields is that NLP data is definitionally human data, right? Even if it's generated data, that generated data is conditioned on human data, um, which is not necessarily the case in things like, you know, signal processing in general. Plenty of signals don't come from humans. Um, it's not the case in computer vision. You can take a picture of anything. It doesn't have to be a picture of a person, but all language data is human data. Um, you know, even if it's if it's a couple removes. Uh, as a result, I think that human subjects, um, you know, ethics is a good way to think about um, what we do and who it affects in a language setting, uh, because human subjects research is all about human data and how you get it and what you do with it. Um, so that's my background. Uh, and it sounds like this paper is really going to pull in um, safety engineering as a framework. So. Uh, reading from the abstract now, uh, inappropriate design and deployment of machine learning system leads to negative downstream social and ethical impacts, described here as social and ethical risks, for users, society, and the environment. Despite the growing need to regulate ML processes, sorry, systems, current processes for assessing them and mitigating risks are disjointed and inconsistent. Uh, we interviewed 30 industry practitioners on their current social and ethical risk management practices and collected their first reactions on adapting safety engineering frameworks into their practice. Namely, System Theoretic Process Analysis, STPA, and Failure Mode and Effects Analysis, FMEA. And neither of these are um, frameworks that I'm familiar with, so um, I think a very interesting uh, and useful paper. Our findings suggest that STPA slash FMEA can provide appropriate structure towards social and ethical risk assessment and mitigation processes. However, we also find non-trivial challenges in integrating such frameworks in the fast-paced culture of the ML industry. We call on the ML research community to strengthen existing frameworks and assess their efficient efficacy, excuse me, uh, ability to have an effect, uh, ensuring that machine learning systems are safer for all people. So, um, yeah, I think the big contributions of this paper are they're like, hey, what about this framework? Have you tried it? Um, and then talk about sort of the challenges of of getting people to try that system. Um, yep. Uh, so I've, I don't know, something I've been thinking a lot about lately, um, and we'll talk uh, a little bit about stable to views in later today, because uh, it's hard not to if you're working in this space right now. Um, and yeah, I think more tools are absolutely great. Um, I also think a big challenge is getting people to use tools, yes, uh, to decide that they want to prioritize not hurting people, um, especially given that uh, so at least sometimes prioritizing not hurting people is going to mean that they make less money, right? Um, so we've talked about a number of companies that are doing things that I straight up consider unethical and are you know, making money hand over fist doing it. Um, and they're not gonna stop doing stuff just because, again, it's against some people's you know, ethical moral code. Um, they're not gonna stop doing stuff until um, basically government sanctions make it unprofitable for them to do it. Um, so, Yes, I think that this is a cool approach. I, um, I'm always interested in hearing about new new frameworks for considering uh, the effects of machine learning and machine learning engineering. It's obviously something that we talk about a lot and I care a lot about. Um, I don't know that just like appealing to the better angels of people's nature um, is necessarily going to be the most effective tool to doing it, but I will say it is a tool uh, and I'm certainly not gonna turn down um, you know, something that might potentially be helpful. Uh, uh, <laughs> like I said, I meant to say that even though uh, I am dyslexic, I challenged myself and did a PhD in language. Yeah, well, I mean, I've talked about this before. I use a lot of aids, right? Like um, a spell check, <laughs> just as a for instance, um, autocomplete, um, you know, um, Especially when I'm doing long spans of text, I'll do sort of a, a combination between typing and um, voice dictation. Uh, so yes, language technology very much helps me and is something that uh, is a big part of my life, even outside of you know being a technologist. So I'm just gonna scroll down uh, and see if we can get to the bit where they talk about these systems because I think that they are uh, interesting and I wanna learn about them. 
Okay, so these are the two systems, uh, FMEA and STPA. Uh, and we'll just talk about these and then move on to the next paper. Uh, so FMEA is failure mode and effects analysis. A long-standing reliability framework takes an analytic reduction, i.e. divide and conquer, approach to identifying and evaluating likelihood of risk for potential failure modes, i.e. mechanism of failure for a technological system or process. Maybe a little bit of a long sentence. Uh, so basically, it, you look at the process, you cut it into chunks, you look at each chunk individually. FMEA has been used in high consequence projects such as space shuttle and US nuclear power plant safety. The FMEA framework helps uncover potential failure modes, identify the likelihood of risk, and address high risk failure modes for a system, i.e. bicycle component, i.e. bicycle tire, or process, i.e. bicycle assembly. FMEA is a multi-step framework through which steps are iteratively performed by FMEA and system experts over the development life cycle. See also figure one. Uh, and the text that I'm about to read covers the content of figure one. Uh, one, list out the functions of a component system or steps of a process, e.g. everything the system slash process needs to perform. Identify potential failure modes or mechanisms by which each function or step can be wrong. Identify the three, identify the effect or impact of a failure and score its severity on a scale of one to 10, least to most severe. Identify the cause or why the failure mode occurs and score of its likelihood of occurrence on a scale of 1 to 10. Identify controls or how a failure mode can be detected and score a likelihood of detection on a scale of 1 to 10. Calculate a risk priority number by multiplying the three scores. Higher RPN indicates higher risk level. Develop recommended actions for each failure mode and prioritize based on RPN. So, uh... I think this makes a lot of sense for mechanical systems. I am, so some things that I'm wondering about, just looking at this. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of imagining that I was a participant and they were like, hey, have you heard of this? How do you think it would work in machine learning? Um, so a big thing that um, I think this does not specifically ask people to think about, or at least in the sort of summary of the system, is unintended secondary uses, right? So um, for both the collection of the data set, unintended secondary uses of the data set, and also the model, unintended secondary uses of the model, um, I think are, would you would have a hard time capturing this model unless it was something you like really specifically were thinking about and considering, um, right? So, you know, listing out the functions of a, of a system, right? So you have, let's say, um, uh, I use this example a lot because I think it's really interesting. Uh, let's say you have uh, Barnes and Noble, uh, and this is not a machine learning example, but it is a socio-technical systems example. Uh, so Barnes and Noble had their like little um, e-reader that also had limited internet access to the Barnes and Noble website, and also um, you could leave reviews on books. And uh, particularly kids who didn't have access to the internet were using book reviews as a way, like as a social media forum, right, to basically talk to each other um, and. Uh, uh, the sort of like um, uh, digital ethnography piece I read on that was specifically about the Warrior Cats, which is a book series, uh, fandom role playing in the comments uh, for the reviews of books on the Barnes and Noble uh, e-reader. Um, so I would say that that is an unintended use of this system uh, that you probably couldn't have predicted beforehand. Um, and in machine learning systems, particularly something on the generative side of things, the unintended secondary uses are infinitely greater than the intended primary uses, right? Um, in a way that I think is probably a little bit rarer with mechanical systems. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, right? So um, for a great example here from the history of technology, um, Captain Crunch whistles, uh, which came in boxes of Captain Crunch, which is a type of cereal, um, happened to produce the same tones as uh, I think Bell was using to control the phone systems. Um, so Phone Freaks, that's F-H-R-E-A-K-S, um, would use these Captain Crunch whistles to hack telephone systems and make free calls, basically. Um, way back in the day, a little, little history of hacking. Um, and that's definitely an unintended secondary use of, a, a, you know, a physical object. So I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but... Uh, yeah, I think that's sort of the, something that I would be a little bit worried about with this particular um, this particular framework is that you don't really have a lot of space, it seems like, to consider that. Uh, 
because you are thinking about specifically, I'm assuming the intended functions of a component or system. Uh, and also, you know, depending on what you're measuring, something that is harmful may not be a failure mode, right? So I'm, you know, I'm a company, I'm serving a model via an API, I want people to use the API. Um, and it turns out that let's say, um, you know, a political candidate is using my API to generate content to attack, uh, to do like uh, astroturfing, to pretend to be a bunch of different people and attack their political opponent. Well, from my point of view, that's not an issue, right? This is system is working as intended, it's serving requests, I'm getting a lot of requests, I'm making money, I'm happy as the company, even though from a wider societal standpoint, I would say that's probably a system that's doing harm. Um, so yeah, I think I think this would be helpful more from like a ops perspective, but maybe a little bit less helpful from a socio-technical systems perspective. Uh, all right, and the next one, um, so maybe this will address some of the, the issues that I had with that first framework, is a system theoretic process analysis, STPA. The hazard analysis method, STPA, is a relatively new technique of taking a system theoretic perspective towards safety. It maps elements of a system, their interactions, and examines potential hazards, i.e. sources of harm. While analytic reduction requires the user of a tool to imagine interactions between components, modeling at the system level is meant to capture emergent phenomena that are well described only by component interactions rather than individual component behavior. Oh yeah, that's something else that I didn't talk about here that I think is uh, very relevant, right? Um, so like we were talking about in, I don't know, two papers ago, right? Where this filtering method reduces, you know, um, performance on benchmarks, but that's because the benchmarks contain hate speech, right? So if your goal is to sort of avoid hate speech performing and preferring models, um, you would need to change both the training data and the benchmark data uh, to get at that, and they interact with each other. Blah, blah, blah. Well, analytic reduction, blah, blah, we talked about that. Uh, STPA has been employed in NASA's space program, the nuclear power industry, and the aviation industry. Uh, and I think they're using these uh, examples in particular, A, because there's folks from the Navy working on here. Um, so I think that's already in their zeitgeist. Um, the US Navy has like nuclear stuff, <laughs> notably submarines. And I don't know whether or not they directly work with NASA, but I know that in order to be like, um, I think most astronauts started as, you know, uh, in either the Air Force or Navy uh, and the aviation industry. In contrast to FEMA, that is the same acronym as the Federal Emergency Act, uh, basically the arm of the executive branch that handles emergency, um, like storm response and stuff. I clicked. I didn't mean to click. Sorry. Let's go back to where we were. Oh, oh, that's a lot of, I really like interview based papers, but uh, there sure are a lot of interviews. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Uh, the STPA process does not focus on reliability, failures, or risk likelihood. Uh, instead, the STPA models the socio-technical system. All right, I think this is going to be a better approach for me, uh, focusing on the structure between components as well as control and feedback loops. Uh, and I'm assuming that those feedback loops include user feedback. Uh, broadly, STPA encompasses the following steps, which are meant to be iterative across the model of a system and cyclic across a cycle's lifetime. Uh, one, define the purpose of the analysis by identifying losses via outlining stakeholders and their values. System-specific hazards or control are then highlighted based on the specified loss. Model the control structure of the full socio-technical system using control feedback loops, which consist of a controller which sends control actions to a system that is being controlled while receiving feedback from the same system. Um, so this could be, you know, a user, this could be a model, um, this could be like your database infrastructure, anything like that I'm getting from this description. Identify unsafe control actions, UCA, by going through each control action and thinking about unsafe modes of no action, so both it's doing something it shouldn't or it's not doing something it should, incorrect action, and untimely action. Uh, identify potential loss scenarios by outlining potential causal scenarios for each UCA. Okay, yeah, this just like for sniff seems like a much better framework for, um, you know, I would say machine learning engineering. I think the first framework might work a little bit better for machine learning operations and deployment. 
Uh, these effects can be applied to positive effect at any stage in development, but can be used to develop requirements that need to be enforced to ensure a safe socio-technical system, such as new design for decisions, requirements, procedures, operating training, test cases, or even periodic audits. Hey, buddy, you want to come up? One sec. I'm going to see if my dog wants to say hi. There you go. All right, bud. Hop up. Oh, maybe he just wanted attention. He doesn't actually want to sit on my lap. That's okay. All right. You sure you don't want to come up? Nope. Okay. He's just looking at me and sighing deeply. Uh, yeah. I saw while I was scrolling just like a little uh big section that they quoted that I thought was interesting. Uh... Mm. <laughs> uh, I tend to gravitate towards algorithmic solutions, but want to qualify that this is not the only way to solve things, and that there are some things mitigatable by algorithmic techniques, in which case, essentially, I defer my expertise to somebody else because maybe the solution in this case is more on the policy side or participatory design methods outside of the scope I'm familiar with. Yeah, definitely. Uh, <laughs> Night Gaming says, way too many acronyms in the paper. Well, I mean, there were some military authors, um, so it does not surprise me. Uh, and then a big section on challenges. Uh, so an AI ethics analyst writes, I think it's inherently, I think inherently what we do is not aligned with the corporation. It's not revenue generating work. In fact, it may be revenue removing work. Uh, it's work that can inhibit the bottom line and a product launch. It can be hard to get product teams to mitigate because they just want to launch the product. Yeah, I think this is a big issue with AI ethics work um, and why a lot of AI ethicists tend to get fired when they're like, hey, you shouldn't do this expensive thing you're trying to do. It's bad. Uh, and the company's like, actually, we wouldn't do it anyway. So we, what if you just weren't here? Shoo. Um, unfortunately uh kind of a common pattern in the field so yeah interesting i hadn't heard of these system these uh potential approaches before uh uh, it's always very difficult because it's an expedited research project. This is artificial. The, the pace at which we do research is completely decided by the research community. We could slow it down at any time. At any time. We have to do it in a month. You are being pressured to do it in the month. It is not necessary. <laughs> this is an artificial pressure. It, it's not like farming, right? Where you have to plant at the right time, your crops are gonna die. It is, it's made up. It's not real. It's not tied to anything. Ah. <laughs> Uh, every time you have to create a data set and you literally have to sit down and think about all the keywords that you were going to put in a model that could go wrong. And ultimately you're creating a data set, but you're creating a data set at a point in time. And we know that people have all these cognitive biases. Yeah. Um, I'm a, uh, sometimes you'll hear about people talking about slow research. Let me see if I can find a good, uh, link for y'all. I can pop in the, uh, channel. Uh, yeah, so slow research is the idea that you can do research slower. <laughs> you don't have to do uh, fast all the time. Um, yeah. I can't find a good, like, uh, specific uh, thing to point you towards, but you can just, you know, use your short engine of choice. Uh, anyway, um, yes, it's definitely uh, challenging, and uh, the fact that being more ethical often means making less money, um, means that corporations are uniquely unsuited to decide what is and isn't ethical. All right, our last thing in the research section, um, which we are doing obviously a little bit more time on each thing. Um, and I was saying that I didn't have that many things, but actually I think I do. <laughs> uh, this is an FYI. Uh, the ACL call for papers is coming up. So if you would like to submit, the submission deadline uh, is January 20th, 2023. So uh, that's the direct submission deadline. Uh, if you are uh, submitting doing the like, ARR thing. Uh, the submission deadline is December 15th. So put that on your calendars if you are trying to get an ACL paper in. Don't forget. All right, practical stuff. I'm going to take a sip of coffee.
but took a while to load. Uh, so, uh, speaking of people doing ethics research, not at corporations, uh, DARE, the Distributed AI Research Institute, uh, which was founded by uh, Timit Gabru, uh, is hiring. So if you are interested, uh, maybe check it out. I'll pop the link in the chat. Uh, and they are hiring specifically a senior community-based researcher uh, and, you know, lots of good folks there. Um, I don't know that much about what it's like as an organization to work at, but uh, maybe be a, a good place to, to do it. Uh, also, the position type is full-time with benefits and the salary range is 140 to 150K USD annually with benefits. So uh, yeah, if you are interested and also meet the qualifications, uh, give it an application. Apply. <sighs> I'm so tired. <laughs> Sorry, it's been a busy week for me. Um, Next up, we have a library that I thought might be of interest to some of you. Uh, so it is um, people calling stuff foundation models. Anyway, um, it's a library for uh, prompt engineering and specifically um, replicability of um, prompting. So uh, to help with prompt, let me just read this. It's manifest. Uh, the URL is github.com slash hazy research slash manifest. Uh, Manifest is meant to be a very lightweight package. Uh, lightweight is usually two words, is usually one word, I think. Lightweight. I think lightweight is usually one word. A uh, package to help with prompt design and iteration. Three key design decisions of Manifest are prompt are functional. They can take an input example and dynamically change. All models are behind APIs. Supports caching of model inputs, outputs for iteration, reproducibly, reducibly, reduce. Doing things the same way more than once and cost savings. So, uh, yep, if you are interested in uh, using it, it works with OpenAI, uh, AI2. I don't know what the one is there, the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence, I'm sharing. Uh, OPT, assuming the model is loaded locally and hugging phase. So, potentially interesting uh, if you are doing a lot of prompt engineering and want a more replicable way to do that. Haven't used it, um, but maybe it's interesting to you. All right, next up. Uh, so I thought this was interesting, and I think uh, Meg Mitchell tweeted about this, and this is how I, I found out about it. Uh, so this is a uh, measure for diversity. Um, so basically looking at a, um, a data set and sort of characterizing how much variation is within that data set. Um, so the measure is called the Vendi score, V-E-N-D-I. Uh, and this is from the Twitter account Vertiax, yeah, question mark, uh, at V-E-R-T-A-I-X underscore, uh, which is a research lab at Princeton led by uh, Aji Boussodier. Uh, it's a, I would go to the, the Vertiax, uh, Twitter and then click on that because it's less typing. Uh, we work at the intersection of artificial intelligence and the natural sciences. Uh, and there is a um, little animated gift here sort of showing the relationship between the uh, diversity in a uh, data set and the Vendi score and showing a covariation matrix. Uh, and as the number of features and the uh, number, the smaller amount of intersection there are between the various feature sets, uh, the higher the score is. So the more and more different your data is, the higher the Vendi score would be. Sorry, I don't know that the quantity of data actually affects it, but the more variation is within your data, the higher the Vendi score will be. So, um, and it is uh, the exponential of the Shannon entropy, I'm reading here, uh, of the eigenvalues of a similarity match. <sighs> The exponential of the Shannon entropy of the eigenvalues of a similarity matrix induced by a user-defined similarity function. Um, so it's an information theoretic measure, basically, um, which seems, yeah, it seems fairly intuitive. Um, and uh, one of the things that they uh, use is sort of a 
reason to use it is uh, I'm reading now, unlike many metrics in machine learning, the Venti score is unsupervised in that it doesn't require a reference data set or distribution over samples or labels that may, makes it applicable for any generative model, data set, decoding algorithm, or any domain where similarity can be defined. Um, yep, so there is a... Uh, uh, a paper. Uh, I'm. I think there was a. <laughs> was there a? There is a hugging face and pip package as well. So I will uh, just copy this to the uh, chat if you are interested in it. One sec. It's done that Twitter link thing that I hate. There we go. So if you're interested in checking it out, there it is. Uh, and it's also part of Hugging Face Evaluate. Uh, and the uh, first author, sorry, the authors on it are Dan Friedman and Ajibuso Diang. Apologies again if I mispronounce anybody's names. Uh, also, Hugging Face has introduced DOIs. Uh, DOIs are digital object identifiers. They are unique strings that are used to identify digital objects. Um, so like data sets will often have them, papers will often have them, um, and uh, they're very useful for you know referencing things in an unambiguous way. So a uh, cool thing uh, that they did, and I appreciate it, and uh, yeah, good to see. That came out on October 7th. Uh, <laughs> uh, so this is a Wall Street Journal article that I just thought was uh, interesting and funny, and I think it's always helpful to think about failure modes of uh, machine learning systems, um, especially because, uh, particularly from a marketing standpoint, companies aren't always incentivized to make sure that uh, consumers know about the failure modes. So uh, the new iPhone 14 and the new Apple Watch have a feature called car, like car crash detection, severe crash detection, um, where basically if they detect using their gyrometers that, you know, ah, there's been a car crash, somebody's flipped over, um, if you don't press a button in five minutes, they will call 911, right? So um, clearly a feature designed to increase people's, you know, safety and well-being and make sure um, people don't get hurt. I mean, people do get hurt, um, you know, help is summoned. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> it has a pretty consistent failure mode, uh, which is that um, people on roller coasters are accidentally triggering a lot of false alerts, uh, presumably because, you know, obviously the gyro owner is going crazy, you're flipping over, you're, you know, loop to loop in, you're accelerating and decelerating very, very quickly. That's what makes roller coasters uh, fun. If you like roller coasters, I happen to. Um, but <laughs> if you are on a roller coaster, you are probably not pulling out your phone to check it uh, and cancel the alert. So uh, apparently uh, it's been having a lot of false positives and a lot of police and you know, fire and emergency departments have been getting calls about like, hey, there was a severe, uh, you know, severe car crash at Six Flags <laughs> in the Six Flags parks. You got to get there right away. So um, yeah, sort of just a funny failure mode, but also, you know, um, something to consider that particularly when systems are deployed, um, you you have to have thought of all of the many ways in which they're going to be used, um, and uh, sometimes you miss them. All right. Oh, this thing. Uh, so we've talked about stable diffusion quite a bit, and I think it's just relevant to a lot of what we've been talking about with IP and code licenses in particular. Uh, so... <laughs> um, Novel AI, which is a company that does uh, AI interactive storytelling, apparently, um, was so sort of like piecing together this sort of information of what happened. Apparently, they uh, did something where they had reused licensed code outside of the bounds of the license. And then after that, they were hacked. Um, and uh, the proprietary, this is reading from uh, the novel AI official account, the leak contained proprietary software and source code for the services we provide. Uh, at this time, we do not suspect that any PII or encrypted information was accessed. Um, yeah, so that seems to be what happened based on my understanding of trying to piece together from people talking about it. Um, yeah, 
Yes. And then obviously people are pretty um, spicy about that. Uh, also sort of on the stable diffusion uh, theme. Uh, so this is a tweet from Daniel Paleka. Again, apologies if I'm saying this incorrectly. Uh, at D-P-A-L-E-K-A. -E um, Stable Diffusion has a safety filter blocking, quote, harmful images by default. This filter is obfuscated. How does it work? So it's uh, work on, um, the title is uh, Red Teaming the Stable Diffusion Safety Filter and its joint work with other uh, authors. Uh, and I believe Florian Tramer was one of the authors on um, the paper that found that GPT-2 was memorizing personal information. Um, so the safety filter can be disabled, which um, I think was an intentional design decision by the Stable Diffusion team, uh, but most downstream applications want to filter that works well. Uh, I'm gonna insert the word commercial in there just in my head and agree with it. Uh, Al Kong says, I really love the dedication you show in talking about research topics. There are very few Twitch tweamers on Twitch like you. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm glad that you find it helpful. Uh, da -da -da. So continuing this sort of thread, which is a summary of a, of a paper, uh, but I think it's sort of more under the practical than, than research side. Uh, we show that the default filter provided by Stability AI and Hugging Face is unreliable, censors only a small subset of not safe for work content, and has many false positive and negatives. Um, so basically the, um, the warning here is that if you're interested in using stable diffusion, um, you know, uh, do not rely <laughs> on their, uh, their safety filter. Um, I mean, I would probably argue don't, don't use it at all, but that's just me. Um, yep. So they're basically saying that it's not great at getting, um, you know, it's not great at filtering, um, you know, erotic content. It's not great at filtering violent content, uh, user beware. All right, next up. Um, oh, this is a big one. So the state of the AI report is out uh, for 2022. Uh, and this comes out every year. Um, it's very focused on sort of industry trends. Um, and yeah. <sighs> Sorry. Uh, I'm just reminded of something. So I think we'll just go through it. Uh, let me take a big swig of coffee. Uh, Robbie says, many people are interested in the application part rather than research. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I get it. Uh, reading research is uh, difficult and time consuming and takes a lot of brain. Certainly for me. All right. Um, and the authors of this are uh, two VC people uh, and basically the, the aim of this I mean, it's not explicitly stated, but it's to help, um, you know, funders uh, keep up on the field and know where to put their money, ideally. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, consider this report, so I'm reading here, <clears throat> as a compilation of the most interesting things we've seen with a goal to triggering an informed conversation around the state of AI and its implication for the future. Um, so, uh, and then they have some uh, thank yous for various PhD students. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, so there's been some discussion on Twitter. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, something I'd just like to point out is here they have a definition for the term AI safety, a field that studies and uh, attempts to mitigate the catastrophic risks to which future AI could pose to humanity. Uh, and in the bottom here, uh, it is uh, defined as identifying and mitigating catastrophic risks that highly capable future AI systems could pose to us. Um, so just how they're defining it. Uh, and a bunch of different definers. Uh, a different, uh, you know, an executive summary of various things, uh, and a scorecard reviewing their predictions from 2021. Uh, they, uh, you know, predicted that transformers will uh, replace RNNs more or less, which yeah, I think happened. Um, the market cap would reach 500 billion. Uh, the current market cap is 165 billion, so you're wrong on there. Um, 
<laughs> uh, Anthropic publishes on the level of GPT Dota AlphaGo to establish itself as a third pole of AGI research. Not yet. Yeah, uh, I'm curious to learn what the Anthropic people are up to, because um, it appears that they are quite well funded, appears to be my impression, but I've not heard a whole lot from them. Uh, prediction, a wave of consolidation in semiconductors. Uh, so this is like of companies that didn't happen. Um, they guessed that small transformers plus CNN and hybrid models match current soda on ImageNet. Um, that did happen. Um, I you know, don't really keep up with computer vision research that closely. Uh, DeepMind shows a major breakthrough in the physical science. Three DeepMind papers in mathematics and material science. I mean, I don't know if those were actually published or press releases, which tends to be, uh, uh, frankly, what the big research labs tend to do. Uh, the JAX framework grows from 1% to 5% of monthly repos, as measured by papers with code, did not happen, so it accounts for less than 1% of monthly repos. Uh, a new AGI-focused research company is formed with significant backing and a roadmap that's focused on a sector vertical, e.g. developer tools or life sciences. Uh, and that did happen. Adept AI was co-founded by the authors of The Transformer uh, and is focused on AGI via software tools using automation. Uh, yep. They certainly get a lot of funding. Uh, and then they have some like later predictions that they're revisiting. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna sort of go through uh, and stop when I see something that is interesting. Uh, and if you'd like to check this out, the uh, URL is stateof.ai. Uh, various things in the life sciences, uh, language models for proteins, researchers independently applied language models to the problem of protein generation and structure prediction while scaling model parameters. Um, they report large benefits from scaling their models. I, I would say that's not surprising. Uh, various stuff on cells. Uh, plastic recycling gets a machine, en machine learning engineered enzyme. That's kind of interesting. Uh, beware of compounded errors with increase of machine learning in quantitative sciences, methodological errors in machine learning can leak to these disciplines. Researchers from Princeton warned of a growing reproducible crisis in machine learning based science driven in part by one such methodological error, data leakage. So data leakage is basically when you have the answer in the training data. Um, generally by accident, it's generally not intended. Uh, and as a result, your model does really well because it finds the signal that is the answer in the training data. Uh, Robbie says, uh, generating machine learning with quantum will replace classical general machine learning algorithms. Maybe. I don't know much about quantum computing. Uh, OpenAI uses Minecraft as a test bed for computer using agents. Uh, Corporate AI labs rush into AI for code research. Oh, AI for code research. They're so talking about um, Codex and Copilot. Uh, more research in the space, including from Salesforce, Google, and DeepMind, uh, including Alpha Code from DeepMind. But yeah, um, again, interesting to see where the laws <laughs> will uh, fall on that. Um, Five years after the Transformer, there must be some efficient alternative, right? Uh, and sort of, no, <laughs> not really. Uh, and the sort of the issue with Transformers that's been around since birth, or certainly language models, is that we're okay at taking a large language model and making it smaller and more efficient. We are not great at training a smaller, more efficient model that is as good in the first place. Um, continues to be challenging. Uh, <laughs> Oh, we're going to talk about this, actually. Uh, mathematical abilities of language models largely surpass uh, expectations. Um, so uh, Minerva, which is a Google system, achieved a 50% score on the math benchmark, um, beating forecaster, forecasters' expedition, expectations for the best score in 2022, uh, 13. Uh, OpenAI has trained a network to solve two uh, mathematical Olympiad pro problems, IMO. That's the name of the system, uh, the International Mathematical Olympiad, not this person saying that that happened in their opinion. Yep, uh, lots of uh, progress on benchmarks, but transformers are fast. I mean, they're, they're big, <laughs> right? Like 
if you increase your number of parameters by an order of magnitude or several orbiters of magnitude, increasing training speed a little bit is not gonna, you know, help that much, right? Uh, LSTMs. Well, I mean, the difference between LSTMs and transformers is that transformers are more parallelizable. Uh, it is not that they require less flops, right? Uh, they, they don't require fewer operations. You can just do all the operations at the same time. So it's faster clock speed, but it's not necessarily faster um, overall training time computer speed. Uh, yep, lots of work on benchmarks, which again, not surprising. Um, the, the talking about the new big benchmark uh, for now, even the best new, even the best models perform poorly on the big benchmark. Um, which, yeah. Uh, language model scaling law, more data, please. Current language models are significantly undertrained. They're not trained on enough data given their large size. Uh, so they train Chinchilla, a four times smaller version of Gopher, on 4.6 times more data, and find that Chinchilla outperforms Gophers and other large models on Big Bench. Um, Yep, <laughs> uh, that's the thing about transformers. They are very parameterized, which means that they do great if they have a lot of data. Um, where's that data coming from? How are you ensuring that it's high quality? How are you ensuring that it is relevant uh, to your task or the downstream tasks? Question mark. Uh, da, da, da. Emergence. Oh, right, so this is sort of like the... Um, it's sort of similar to double descent, kind of, in that you get a step function in, uh, you know, overall performance on the target metric. Um, large language learning capabilities emerge unpredictably when models reach a critical size. These acquired capabilities are exciting, but the emergence phenomenon makes evaluating model safety more difficult. Yes. Um, also, like how good it is in general. Uh, Yes, and then um, some discussion. Yes, you're so cute. I don't know if you heard the the pew sound. That's for my dog. Some more discussion of uh, using um, search tools as you know. That was him again. <laughs> uh, using uh, you know queries as part of your your conversation, which we talked about uh, some research on that last uh, week, I believe. Um, yeah, and sort of looking at, you know, a compute availability over the last couple of years, um, which has gotten bigger if you have money for it. Um, diffusion stuff, diffusion stuff, yeah. Uh, we don't really need to get into that. Uh, text to video, cool. <laughs> uh, lots of community-driven open sourced uh, stuff in general, uh, robotic stuff, uh, vision predictions, uh, cross-modal transformers, which we've seen a lot of. <laughs> I may actually just go through the research section. Uh, and now we're into the like molecular uh, chemistry stuff, uh, talking about uh, Chinese language papers uh, on machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, and now we're into the industry stuff. So we're 50 slides in, <laughs> which is plenty. Um, but yes, so if you're interested, uh, I would check it out. Um, it's, you know, I would say a fairly... Um... Actually, can I just jump to safety? Yeah, let's look at safety real quick, because uh, I think that's something else that we really care a lot about. Uh, <laughs> Nine Gaming says, do they talk about skepticism by Anne LeCun and Noam Chomsky for Transformers solving AGI? I mean... Uh, I don't know how much I've talked about it on the channel, but um, I think AGI is a hypothesis that some people have <laughs> um, that they have convinced people to spend a lot of money on. Um, I, I, I'm not convinced that it is, you know, possible, let alone present. Um, and yeah. I don't know. That's sort of my stance. And I think that it's really a um, a big frustration for me is that it's taken a lot of the wind out of the sails of um, other more pressing ethical debates. Um, for example, you know, 
a lot of stuff that we talk about in the ethics section every week, right? Like actual people being actually harmed. Uh, so that's just sort of my talk. I don't know if they talked about it or not. I didn't see it. Uh, Robbie says the Dolly 2 API experimental, is it used in industry? No idea. No idea. I don't really work in uh, computer vision. All right, so let's talk about safety and see what they talk about. Yep, oh, it's gonna be all about AGI stuff. Um, Yep. Uh, early AI pioneers considered that highly capable and economically integrated AI systems of the future could fail catastrophically and pose a risk to humanity, uh, including through the emergence of behaviors directly opposed to human oversight and control. Yes, so very much sort of in that, that general vein. Um, I would say that there is a direct risk to people right now by systems that currently exist and are being deployed uh, and that we are not really considering <laughs> uh, or doing enough about, and in my humble opinion as someone who has been in the ethics space for um, a couple years now um yep uh the uk is <laughs> the uk's government uh routinely the most uh stable and um uh, you know forward thinking of uh all governments uh, is really talking about agi <laughs> Uh, AI researchers increasingly believe that AI safety is a uh, serious concern. Thinking about AGI stuff. Uh, not a survey of the ML community, um, unless they are talking about a separate community. That's not this one. Da, da, da. I found a majority believe in AGI is an important concern that we are making progress towards. I mean, they're welcome to their opinion. Uh, AI safety is uh, attracting more talent. And again, we're not talking about, you know, we are not talking about ethics here um, or, you know, fairness, accountability and transparency, machine learning. We are talking specifically about this hypothetical thing that people are pouring money and, uh, you know, resources into uh, where they are not pouring those same money and resources into consumer protections um, or advocacy. Um, lots of funding, lots of money. Um, yes, definitely a thing. Uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback or human in the loop, a uh, key method to fine tune large language models and align them with human values. Um, I'm generally a fan of human in the loop. I think that's fine. Um, I don't think it's necessarily like, I don't think aligning AI is like a great use for it, but you know, um, learning from human feedback. Uh, NYU researchers demonstrated that language models can be improved directly using human feedback written in language, so that's nice. Um, which again, makes sense, right? Because it's tuning where in the, you know, where in the watermelon you're pointing to and human language is basically like over here in the watermelon. Uh, red teaming, uh, so I think this is, uh, you know, very important we talked about this. I would say that this is much more in the, um, um, I would say that this is more in the general ethics space, um, right? So particularly like, uh, you know, biases in chatbot output. And we talked about the this uh, chatbot paper on the channel a while ago when it came out. Uh, yeah. In the future, a classifier could detect for speculative risks such as power speaking or malicious coding. I'm assuming that those are speculative risks that the model would be doing. People are being killed by AI weapons, like right now, like right now, that's happening. Ugh. Um, can we reverse engineer a neural network? So this is sort of, uh, um, you know, Da, da, da. induction heads that learn to copy and complete sequences that occurred before in a test. Uh, oh, I didn't hear about this. Um, Researchers in Anthropic released significant analysis of small transformer-based language models focusing on a phenomenon of induction heads that learn to copy and complete sequences which occurred before in a text. Okay, so is this similar to the memorization research that we talked about earlier? They find these heads emerge during phase shifts, quote, in training during which in-context learning capabilities also emerge and further developed a hypothesis that these heads may be uh, responsible for the majority of in-context learning capabilities in large transformer models as well. Follow-up work on the space has brought to light ways in which individual neurons become responsible for individual or multiple semantic features and ways to control this type of uh, interpretability. I don't think I've read any of this work. So induction heads. 
It sounds a little bit similar to the trigger work. Let's see, when was this published? Also induction heads are a, um, uh, an engine part I just learned. Uh, March of this year. Da, da, da. Mechanistic interpretability. Now I'm reading from, uh, I believe, the paper itself. Attempting to reverse engineer the detailed computations performed by the model offers one possible avenue for addressing their safety issues. Um, those safety issues are previously addressed in the text as uh, assorted safety problems. Uh, if we can understand the internal structures that cause transformer models to produce the outputs they do, then we may be able to address current safety problems more systematically. What are the safety problems? <laughs> you have not said what those are. As well as anticipating safety problems in future more powerful models, note that mechanistic interpretability is a subset of the broader field of interpretability, which encompasses many different methods from explainable outputs of a neural network. Mechanistic interpretability is distinguished by a specific focus on trying to systematically characterize the internal circuitry of a neural network. Ah, in the past, mechanistic interpretability has largely focused on CNN vision models. Okay, so this would not be a research area I'd read in previously because I mainly read in NLP because that's what my background's in. All right. Uh, ultimately, our goal is to reverse engineer frontier language models, which often contain hundreds of layers and billions and trillions of parameters, not merely two layer attention only models, which were the sort of toy examples they were working with. Uh, when you add layers, it becomes more difficult. Okay. Uh, we present preliminary and indirect evidence for a tantalizing hypothesis. That's academic for, we got nothing, but if we did, this is what it would be. Uh, that induction heads might constitute the mechanism for actual majority of all in-context learning in large transformer models. Okay, well, that's something. <laughs> uh, A.L. Kung says, stable, UK? Uh, I'm not entirely sure what that was in reference to. Uh, Mind Gaming says, is the red team concept borrowed from cybersecurity? Yes, it absolutely is. So, um, no <laughs> is the answer to this header uh, based on this research project, which, um, again, at a, a sort of uh, first blush um, seems to be a... I, would, I can see why this did not come across my sort of social network, um, even though my social network does have a lot of folks who are interested in interpretability as a topic. So, sorry, that was me reading in another tab uh, in another window. Uh, goal misgeneralization, agents can learn the right schools with the wrong objective. Um, yes, <laughs> trivially true. Um, that's not fair. Um, this is specifically like agent-based learning. Um, but yes, I would say that, um, you know, metric mismatch and misalignment is definitely uh, an issue. <laughs> uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Perverse incentives uh, in particular are particularly an issue in machine learning systems. Measuring moral behavior in artificial agents out of Berkeley. Uh, Future artificial agents may be pre-trained on swaths of environments that do not penalize and may even reward behavior such as murder and theft. Uh, as a first step, they use language models with moral knowledge and mediates this knowledge into action. This greatly reduces immoral behavior over the course of training. Mm -hmm. who, who is building and deploying these agents? This, this is, I don't know. It's one of those things where like, it's treated as such an inevitability, but it is unbelievably uninevitable, right? Anyway, um, Conjecture is the first well-founded startup focused purely on AGI alignment. Conjecture is a great name for the startup. Uh, assumes that we'll get there in the next five years, which I would say is an assumption that a lot of people have had for um, several decades. Uh, and they got a lot of money. Anyway, predictions. Yeah. So, um, yeah, a lot of sort of discussion about this hypothetical thing that if it happens, it will happen because somebody intentionally did it on purpose. Uh, and not a lot of discussion of the uh, enormous number of ethical issues that are currently happening and currently affecting people. And this 
This is why I am so frustrated with the AI safety people who have, again, millions of dollars in funding. Maybe more. Blah. Moving on. Um, oh yeah, so I think this is just interesting. Um, so this is from IEEE Spectrum, which is IEEE's like popular science. Hey, you, 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 here's some stuff. Um, magazine, I guess. I guess it's an online magazine. Um, and something that I thought w that popped out at me that was really interesting here was the way that people outside the field were talking about language models and their expectations of language models in particular, and how I think that this is reflective of poor science communication <laughs> from the field. Um, so uh, the uh, the thing that really just like gets to me is this like this first section here and then over the background, like down through it, they're like, yeah, I can do some math, but you know, it's bad when the numbers are bigger. Bigger numbers are less likely to be represented in the training set. Oh. <laughs> it makes errors like being off by a power of 10 or reversing digits. Um, which, yes, again, um, why would it have a grounded and accurate approach to math? That's not something that language models are trained on. It's uh, unreasonable to expect them to have that. But um, if computers are good at anything, they are good at math. So it may come as a surprise that after much struggling, top machine learning uh, researchers have recently made breakthroughs in teaching computers math. I hate this framing. Um, and basically they're like, language models are a computer thing that computers are doing. So they are really bad. Like why would they be bad at word problems, right? They should be fine. Um, yes, so I think that what was most interesting and useful for me in this article was this framing about like the assumptions of the capabilities of computers and the assumption that large language models are standing in for computers, right? That these are um, agents and sort of like a, uh, a philosophical sense, which they are not, right? But that's the assumption that users are having when they interact with them and that they can do what computers do. Uh, and I think a lot of this really draws on sort of um, robots and science fiction. Um, and people's expectations of systems are really built based on that, right? Um, yeah, also there was something at the end here, which just like, <laughs> da, da, da. what was it? Uh, uh, let's see, this bit at the end here where they were like, well, you know, humans also give inconsistent answers, make errors, and fail to apply, apply core concepts. Uh, the borders of this frontier of machine learning are blurred, um, which is very like, human errors and machine learning errors are not correlated, <laughs> right? Like that was a big, you know, thing that I was doing in my in my graduate studies, uh, particularly with ASR systems was showing that human-like errors and system errors were, um, unless you intentionally incorporated additional social information about speakers, very different. And by incorporating that additional social information, you could, if that was something that you were actively working towards, get a system that made the types of errors that a human would make, but it was not guaranteed. Guaranteed. Um, and this sort of like, well, people aren't perfect, so yeah, we probably have human level performance. They're not saying this, but um, you know, well, you know, our our system, which we are sort of referring to as a person, um, makes errors, but you know, so do people. So really, is it that different? Um, this framing, just like, yes, it's very different. The types of errors are, uh, are, are really distinct. So anyway. Um, <laughs> Nine Gaming says, I hope AGI doesn't become a means for another Ponzi scheme. Uh, I mean, it's something that doesn't exist that people are getting millions and millions of dollars to study because they, they tell you that it might someday. So I will leave it up to you what you think about that. Um, so I feel like I have dunked quite a bit on... Uh, computer vision. <laughs> so when I come across a computer vision problem, like thing that I really think is cool and interesting, I like to talk about it because it's just like 
there are a lot of applications of computer vision that I am not down with, but there's also a lot that I think it has the capability to make people's lives better. And here's a good one. Um, so this is by at WGJB Mattingly, Dr. WGJB Mattingly, who is a, a digital humanities uh, fellow. And he has a little streamlet app uh, that lets you search 100,000 publicly available medieval manuscripts. And this is the really cool thing. Uh, you can search with a custom image and find similar pages. So I think this has the potential to save, you know, digital humanists so much time. I think it's a cool, very specialized application that's clearly done with the end users in mind, right? Um, he is a, uh, you know, himself a, uh, a digital humanist. It's built for other people in his field. Uh, cool, has the potential to save people time. Rachel approved, good job. <laughs> oh, one sec, good job. Uh, see, I'm not just hating on, on computer vision for no reason. Uh, there are projects that I like. Hmm. And then the MacArthur Foundation uh, announced their fellows. So if you're not familiar, the, uh, the MacArthur Foundation fellows get a lot of money and it's very prestigious. Uh, and Eugene Choi from uh, the University of Washington, where I got my PhD, so we have an institutional affiliation, uh, got... Uh, was elected, um, which is cool. So congrats to her. Um, and I think probably the stuff that you might be most familiar with is that uh, she works on, uh, what's a gooey high fountain? Uh, she works on uh, common sense reasoning. And she was also, I think the first author on the Delphi paper. Um, and I think as a test system, Delphi was interesting. Uh, I'm not, yeah, did you open the door to come in and say hi? Uh, sorry, my dog can open doors and it's an issue. You can't keep them out of places. Um, yes, I love you too. Uh, I just, I think the thing that was an issue was that some of the press surrounding it was maybe a little bit, uh, made bolder claims than I probably would have in their shoes and then also deploying it publicly. Um, I don't know. I think it can be fine, but I think you need to be, you know, uh, very uh, careful with your your communication. And I think the, the communication around that project was eh, not great, but it was interesting research. Um, and yeah, congrats to uh, Professor Troy. Hello, Razi HR. Welcome, welcome. Time for politics, uh, which as usual, we're gonna talk about court cases, congressional stuff. Um, Unfortunately, pretty U.S. focused this week, but um, I, that just happened to be uh, where things were happening that I heard about. Uh, so the first thing uh, is this uh, field hearing from the uh, National Artificial Intelligence Advisory Committee, uh, which had a bunch of different people in the field um, talking about stuff. Um, yeah, and I think it was interesting to hear about. Um, there's also, if you're interested in the transcripts, you can get the, the whole transcripts load here. Uh, so I will I'll pop that in the chat in case you would like to get it and read through it. And these are human transcripts. Um, yeah, so a lot of, shoot, shoot, shoot. Well, anyway, that's where they were. Um, a lot of interesting discussion that went on. And uh, obviously, I don't know if you can see this, it's seven hours, so it's very long. Uh, but if it is something that you're interested in hearing uh, about sort of what the hearing about, uh, actually the National Institute of Standards and Technology, I don't know. One sec. Let me see really quickly. I, whoop. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm pretty sure they're run by the legislative branch, but I can double check really quick. <laughs> Non-regulatory agency of the U.S. Department of Cong or Commerce. Oh, so it might actually be executive. But anyway, they set standards for technology. You may be you know, surprised to hear. Uh, and this was their um, hearing. Uh, if you're interested, uh, that's where you can find it. Oh, thank you. Uh, Rod says, your notebooks were super helpful to get started and get more into more depth. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
That's always nice to hear. I appreciate that. I'm glad they could help you. Uh, my dog is on my feet right now and it's very warm. Uh, it's kind of nice. Keeping my toes warm. Next up, ooh, so this is a, uh, uh, actually a research paper, but I put it in the politics section because it was in a law journal. Um, and again, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I cannot uh, give you a legal opinion on this. Uh, but what I thought here was particularly um, relevant uh, is uh, this idea that, you know, um, searching people uh if you just like ask them you can get their consent and then it's fine right um so just to read here so this is by i should say rosanna summers and vanessa k bonds b-o-h-n-s and it's from the yale law journal and the title is the voluntariness of voluntary consent consent searches and the psychology of compliance um and reading from the abstract here uh consent-based searches are by far the most ubiquitous search form of search undertaken by police a key legal inquiry in these cases is whether consent was granted voluntarily this essay suggests that fact finders' assessments of voluntariness are likely to be impaired by systematic bias and social perception. Fact finders are likely to underappreciate the degree to which suspects feel pressure to comply with police officers' requests to perform searches. Um, and so the, the general idea of this study was um, they had a bunch of participants and uh, in one group they were like, hey, there's this, this situation. Um, would you know uh would most people say that this is a reasonable thing to do right um so you had i think in this case uh da, 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 the request was highly intrusive i'm reading here to unlock their password protected smartphones and hand them over to an experiment to search through while they waited in another room um which hi -ye, whoa, even just hearing about that makes me feel um deeply uncomfortable, right? Like phones are very personal. People use them to take photos, to communicate with their loved ones. Um, you know, they have their calendars in them. You could probably get someone's, you know, physical address from somewhere on their phone in most cases. So um, very sensitive data, very intrusive to do. And basically what they asked was they asked a bunch of people like, hey, would you let somebody do this? And the people were all like, no, are you kidding? That's horrible. Uh, but then when they actually did that, um, most people felt really pressured into agreeing and saying yes when they had someone who was in a position of authority being like, hey, give me your phone. Unlock it and give me your phone and just leave. It's fine. Just do it. Uh, and most people did it, right? So 100 out of 103 people promptly unlocked their phones and handed them over. Uh, experiencers reported feeling significantly less free to refuse than forecasters complementing the same situation hypothetically, right? So um, even though consent, quote unquote, was given, it was in a really coercive environment uh, and people not in that environment would, were like hey that's not cool and people in that environment felt pressured to comply um Anyway, uh, and then they tested like, hey, does telling people that they have the right to not comply make them not comply? Uh, and it absolutely did not. <laughs> uh, it did not significantly reduce compliance rates or make experiencers feel more free to say no. Um, so basically, this is an experimental study that's like, hey, by the way, um, a lot of the consent that happens in this situation where someone with authority um, who can also, you know, in the US uh, physically hurt you, <laughs> Uh, and probably get away with it, um, makes people kind of unwilling to say no. Uh, and even if they've been told that they can say no, they kind of don't trust it, which is, uh, you know, sad, but also uh, good to know, right? Good to have this experimental evidence to, to point to. Uh, uh, I says, my phone with an R2-D2, he might step on it. All right, next up. Uh, mm, this one. Uh, so executive order, this came out October 7th, 2022, and it's from whitehouse.gov. Um, executive order on enhancing, enhancing, enhancing safeguards for United States signals intelligence activities, uh, which I think most people would just like call spying. Um, and I, you know, read through some of this and was like, I don't get it. <laughs> uh, just cause I, I didn't get a lot of it. Uh, so what I found helpful was this thread from the Center for Democracy and Technology, which I will link for you if you would like to check it out. 
um, which is a uh, um, think tank slash human rights advocacy organization um, shaping technology policy and architecture with a focus on equity and justice. Uh, and I've been, you know, following them and their work for a while, uh, and I generally find it to be pretty helpful to me. Um, so their summary is, it takes some positive new steps. Uh, it requires signals intelligence surveillance directed abroad must be for purposes that, well, broad, may be narrower than permitted under the existing authorities, right? So a little bit of protection for people outside of the US. Um, it also establishes a new data protection review court to hear claims from people in designated countries. Uh, it does not require that people subjected to surveillance receive notice. Um, so. If you were surveilled and you happen to find out about it, you might have some recourse, but you may never find out about it. Uh, the attorney general chooses the judges, but they cannot be employees of the federal government. Their decisions are final and they can't be fired except for cause. Uh, but questions remain about the breadth of permissible surveillance and whether in practice the new DPRC will provide a forum for meaningful redress in the events of unlawful slash improper surveillance. And I'm continuing to read here. It remains uncertain whether EU authorities and ultimately the EU Court of Justice will deem these steps sufficient to satisfy the legal requirements for a new adequacy decision to support transatlantic data flows. Um, so yes, TBD how this, um, bless you. I don't know if you heard that, my dog sneezed. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. Um, Razzie says, do you think there might already be, bless you, buddy, you okay? You sneezy? Uh, do you think there may already be a surveillance that may not be public, but integrated into the phones? Um, yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so you mean like in the chips themselves? Um, yeah, maybe possibly. I don't know. Um, I mean, the surveillance that like is certainly happening right now in the United States. Um, the United States government is straight up just buying data from data brokers. Um, so, you know, if you've used an app and that app gave people data, um, the US government may have it. Um, the Department of Homeland Security, we talked about this last week, I think, is um, harvesting data from people's phones um, at, you know, airports, ports, points of entry. Um, and there's very minimal oversight into what they do there. And they may possibly also be doing, doing like one hop. So not just that person's information, but their contacts information uh, out for like a social network thing. So, yeah. <laughs> um, yep. Uh, and uh, a point they make is we need to put basic guardrails on how broadly the government can target individuals for surveillance. Uh, FISA section 702 should be narrowed by law. So targeting is based on general, genuine national security and foreign intelligence needs, not the current catch-all, which is very much happening. Um, uh, defend, so this is also like their claims about what should happen. Defendants should also receive notice when the government conducts surveillance under 702 and should not be able to use the state secrets doctrine to block leg litigation. Um, we vigorously advocated for these and other FISA reforms for years and will keep doing so in the lead up to section 702 expiring in 2023. So um, basically it sounds like the executive order provided maybe a little bit of additional protection, but really doesn't go far enough um, from a sort of privacy and rights perspective um, that uh, the Center for Democracy and Technology is representing. So, yeah, <laughs> Bazzi says, uh, yes, it's not great. However, if you do care about privacy and, uh, you know, individual autonomy, I got great news for you. And that is that BNSF, which is a large railroad uh, company here in the United States, perhaps the largest, um, they lost a, a really big court case in Illinois. So Illinois has this, um, was it like IBSC? Is it in here somewhere? Uh, BIPA, here we go. Uh, is the first state law addressing biometric privacy, turning Illinois into a legal battleground for companies accused of, I scrolled, uh, of improperly collecting fingerprints, eye scans, and other biological data from consumers or workers. And this is an issue uh, in particular because if, you know, you have somebody's iris scan and you're hacked, I can't change my irises, right? So now that information is just out there and there's nothing that people can do to protect themselves from it besides not have it be um, collected in the first place. Uh, and if it is your workplace that is collecting it, then you really have, you know, limited ability to say no, like the coercion paper we just talked about, right? If your boss is like, hey, if you want to continue working here, I need all your thumbprints. Um, 
can you say no to that? Not really, right? Like you need to have food. Um, and in the United States, healthcare uh, is often tied to employment as well. So like, you know, you're on a medication that you need to get that you know that your current employer sponsored healthcare covers, but like COBRA doesn't. If you say no, <laughs> you are putting yourself in direct physical danger. Um, so yes, not great. Um, but uh, the VNSF very much lost their case uh, and 228 million in damages were ordered in the judgment. Um, a class of more than 45,000 truck drivers won a $228 million judgment in the first biometrics privacy class action law uh, to go on trial in Illinois after a jury found that BNSF railway company violated state law by collecting employee fingerprints without proper consent. So um, huge win for privacy. Um, obviously this is one state law and I believe that um, it's Illinois, right? Yeah, Illinois is the only state currently that has such a law on the books, but uh, maybe something will be in soon somewhere else. So cheers to those truck drivers. Uh, I'm sorry your data was stolen and I'm glad you got restitution. Next up, hmm, speaking of wins, this isn't an EU court, I believe, in the Netherlands. Well, uh, this is all, <laughs> I'll give you the highlights. So this is a Fortune article, and as I scrolled down, uh, it was uh, fuzzed out. Um, oh, I should say, sorry, the last um, article that we read came out on October 12th, 2022. Uh, today, a hot off the presses, uh, and was in Bloomberg Law. Uh, oh, and it was by, sorry, Sky, S-K-Y-E, Whitley. Um, I have not been doing a great job reading reporters by lines, and for that I apologize. Uh, and this one is from Fortune, and it's by Alice Hearing, and it's from October 10th. Um, and basically, so this was a, a, a Dutch contractor, I believe, uh, who was working for a company in Florida, and the company was requiring him to keep his uh, laptop web camera on eight hours throughout the entire workday uh, and I believe he was working from his home and was like no I don't want to and also this violates my rights as an EU citizen um, and he took them to court and he won a $73,000 payout um, and I believe he won after being fired right so he did lose his job which not great um, but yes another great privacy win in the court so you'll love to see it nice little mm -hmm. desserts delicious all right, and that's all the policy stuff I have today. Let's hop on into ethics, which we covered a little bit earlier with my just like, deep, abiding frustration with the money and the attention, which is scant to begin with, because again, it doesn't make anybody money. Uh, well, it doesn't make any companies money unless they are, you know, selling something. Um, pulling it away from direct harms that are happening to individuals. Uh, so this is more on the research ethics side than the AI ethics side, but I think it's, you know, um, sucks. <laughs> uh, and I wanted to bring it up so that if you're, if any of you happen to be in a position where you can prevent this happening, please do. Uh, so this is from at Travis Drake on Twitter, who is a carbon biogeochemist uh, at ETH Zurich. Uh, and he had a situation where a new manuscript was sent back because the co-authors didn't have institutional email addresses. So in, in the US, that would be like, um, you know, for the University of Washington, uw.edu. This is not fair to our Congolese co-authors who institutions cannot afford, afford to provide email services. It is also not fair to those who are not affiliated, in quotes, with an institution. So. Um, the, you know, I don't know at what phase this manuscript was being um, looked at, right? So this could have been without review. It could have been like after review. Who knows? Um, it wasn't wasn't clarified here. Uh, but these researchers were excluded from a research community because uh, basically they didn't go to a rich. They weren't affiliated with a rich Western uh, university, and that stinks. Uh, yeah, if you're in a situation to do this, please uh, make sure it doesn't happen. Uh, Nangami says, in India, we have Adhar, which has been, has iris scan of both eyes and fingerprints of all fingers. Uh, it's used almost everywhere for making bank accounts to filing income tax returns. Uh, there have been uh, several news stories in the past about hard details being sold on the dark web. Uh, and for those of you who are listening uh, to the podcast, that is A-A-D-H-A-A-R. Uh, and I know that those are long vowels and I know that I can't say them correctly. So apologies. Um, ah. 
Yeah, I remember we talked about that a while ago. So specifically with uh, folks, I want to say in North East India. I don't remember the exact uh, location. I'm very sorry. Um, where the food um, food aid, right, like rice, in order to access the rice, you needed to like have your biometrics harvested, um, and it sounds like it's been hacked. So, ah, that is uh, really upsetting. I'm sorry to hear that. Robbie says, if the camera's off and the video's off, then how does the employee or the employee is working? I mean, is this person's job to sit in front of a camera and look at it? If it's not, then uh, there's probably other ways to do it, right? So are they finishing their assigned tasks? Yes, no, uh, they, they would know that. Perhaps, uh, to be clear, I think Robbie here might be being facetious, but um, I just wanna sort of like talk about, you know, in digital remote work, how do you know that I've done what I've said I've done, right? So, um, you know, I work remotely, so how do I know, how do people know that I've done my teaching and done my preparation for my teaching? Well, I. Uh, I show up to my classes, right? And my students are there uh, and, you know, I'm prepared because I have curriculum ready and we discuss it. Um, and, you know, in theory, you have things like student reviews that are like, this professor never once showed up to class <laughs> where people would probably notice, right? Um, but yeah, and I, forcing people to be in a specific location for a specific set of time in a knowledge work setting just does not make sense right like if i commission somebody to you know draw me an art i don't care that they sat in front of a computer for eight hours i care that the art is done right and i don't care when they did it and i don't care where they did it and i don't care how they did it i care about the final product that's what matters to me right um well i do care about like how long it takes them because i want to make sure that they're compensated fairly for their labor but um that's the second question right and that's that's not what employers are doing. So this idea that like the thing that makes somebody a good worker is that they are sitting in front of the computer is ridiculous, right? So I mean, I'm assuming most of you are, are coders. Um, if you get stuck on a bug, the thing that for me is often the most helpful is to go walk, right? So I'll go on a walk, I'll mumble to myself, I'll be like, okay, da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. and then I'll usually come back fresh with a couple new ideas so I can try for debugging. Um, I tend to prefer that to just rubber ducking, but that's just my preference. Um, or like, I'll go do the dishes, but I'm working, right? I'm doing knowledge work. I'm focused on the problem at hand, but I'm not sitting in front of my computer while I'm doing it. So that's a, uh, it's petty and tyrannical to demand that people are in a specific location while doing knowledge work. Um, and I hate it. Uh, all right, next up. This one, right? So again, talking about ethics, like, ugh. Um, so there's a discussion here. Uh, so uh, let's just talk about this. Um, so this is from NPR. Uh, it came out on October 10th. The headline is, Artificial Intelligence Could Soon Diagnose Illness Based on the Sound of Your Voice. Uh, and it's by Carmen Molina Acosta. It's a three minute listen if you're listening to it, but I'm not going to. Um, and the sort of article is about a uh, big NIH, National Institute of Health, funding for a massive research project to collect data and develop uh, an AI that could diagnose people based on their speech. And I will say, diagnostics based on signal processing for specific disorders is already very much a thing, right? There was a project at UW that did it, like you, you'd phone in and they'd be like, maybe you have Parkinson's. Um, a while ago, right? That's been around, um, you know, different, different particularly types of like speech problems <laughs> could definitely be uh, deduced from the sound of a voice. Um, but uh, this is, you know, uh, this data collection is, uh, <laughs> um, I'm a little bit nervous that this is not perhaps going to be money well spent. Let me put it that way. Uh, so let me read this. Um, we asked experts, well, if you close your eyes when a patient comes in just by listening to their voice, can you have an idea of the diagnosis they have? Uh, and that's where we got all our information, right? So I think that you may have, you know, it may narrow down the number of things, but I wouldn't want somebody to just listen to my voice and give me a diagnosis of the issue I had, right? So um, someone who speaks slow and steady slowly may have Parkinson's disease. Slurring is a sign of a stroke. It's also a sign of like a lot of other stuff. Um, scientists could even di diagnose depression or cancer. 
like maybe some types of throat cancer, maybe some types of mouth cancer, but like your speech is not gonna give like great clues about your pancreas, right? Um, also diagnosing depression from speech sounds like a huge can of worms. Uh, the team will start by collecting the voices of conditions, uh, people in conditions with five areas, neurological disorders, voice disorders, mood disorders, respiratory disorders, and pediatric disorders, like autism and speech delays. Also causing, calling autism a quote, pediatric disorder is uh, not what I would do, let me put it that way. Um, so yeah, um, the goal is to create a large scale healthcare database for precision medicine. Uh, we were really lacking in what we would call open source databases. Uh, Ben Susan says, every institution kind of has their own database of data, but to create these networks and these infrastructures, we really, it was really important to allow researchers from other generations to use this data. Um, yes, so do I think that necessarily this type of data collection is bad? No, not at all. Um, I will say that like, just as a machine learning person, right? If the thing that you're doing is collecting data of people with disorders and your goal is to identify those disorders, I hope to God this is directly parallel to other data uh, from people that you know don't have any of the disorders that you're looking at, right? Like what's your, you know, what are you discriminating from? Um, and hopefully they thought of that about that. That's my, my hope. And hopefully this is just sort of like, uh, the way that this is being described in a popular news article is just sort of not being super... Mm, not being super clear and some nuances are being lost and they have thought about that, I hope. But yeah. Um, yeah, so that's my first big thing is like, what what are your, your you know non-disorder samples uh, and also the choice of um a couple other things here so one open sourcing this data right so this is going to be voice data voice data is biometric it is pii i can listen to somebody's voice and to know who they are um, i also can deduce a lot of uh, sociological data about them because that's reflected in your in the speech signal um, i have no idea what the coverage of different people from different sociological backgrounds is going to be like in this system um, right so that's potentially going to be an issue um, Obviously, all of these things are going to have, you know, if you're looking at people who have di diagnosed these conditions, any sort of bias in the diagnosis process will also come up with this, right? Um, so, like, a great example of that is that certainly historically, autism has been diagnosed much more uh, commonly in, um, you know, men than women or other genders. Um, so there's probably going to be a uh, disproportionate representation of, um, you know, gender representation within the autism data. Um, yeah, also specifically things like mood disorders, if they're open sourcing this, right, does that mean that anyone with a GPU and like some, you know, norming data can build a quote unquote depression detector? Because that feels like an issue, right? Like. There's so I've talked about research ethics before and how that's an important uh, framework for me and as I understand data and particularly again voice data has to be human data. Um, something that's particularly prescient to me is uh, that I have lost my train of thought. Okay, sorry, what was I talking about? So I was talking about sociological variation. I was talking about the fact this is PII and people are identifiable. Oh, right. Um, what are the potential negative consequences on people, right? So if all this data is open sourced and anyone can build this model, right? And let's say you find it on Hugging Face and you're like, oh, depression detector, I'm just gonna use this. Um, diagnosing people uh, or even attempting to diagnose people in the research ethics space has a lot of ethics around it, right? So sometimes if you are in a study and you are diagnosed with something in the course of the study, you won't be told about that and you'll be informed about it, right? Like when the study begins, like, hey, if we diagnose you with something, we're not going to tell you about it. Um, Right. Uh, so telling people about diagnoses and particularly sharing information about diagnoses is very fraught. Um, and add on to this that this is in the United States, right, where um, whether or not you have access to health insurance is uh, kind of at the discretion of some companies, <laughs> right? And they're trying to maximize profit margins. So if you call, let's say, a health insurance company, you're like, hey, I want an account. And they run there like, Doo -doo 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 -doo. this person has depression. Absolutely not. Click, right? Yeah, 
hypothetical scenario, um, but one that we certainly don't have protections against right now, right? Uh, legal protections. So yes, secondary uses of the system, very worrying to me. Um, you know, implicit bias in this speech uh, data set, very worrying to me. Of course, there's identifiable information. So how are you going to protect the identity of people with, let's say, uh, neurological disorders or mood disorders to make sure that they're not de-anonymized? Very difficult. Um, so yeah, you're worrying. <laughs> uh, worrying to me. Um, and hopefully it'll be fine. Hopefully it'll be fine, but uh, definitely something I'm going to keep an eye on from an ethics start uh, standpoint. Uh, Nine Gaming says we shouldn't treat software development the same as assembly line in a factory. Um, I agree. Um, I also I don't know. I've got a lot of thoughts <laughs> uh, that are a little bit. Uh, uh, that's a lot to go in on. Um, so. I will say two things, which like, yes, I think we should treat uh, everyone with more autonomy and dignity, uh, and also that people who work in factories should uh, get paid more and have to work fewer hours. Um, uh, that's my stance on that. Excuse me. Um, and also this like hint that there may be like commercial cooperation with Alexa, Amazon, you're gonna help Amazon diagnose people? on their devices that they may or may not be able to opt out of. Ah! Anyway, very worried about this process, uh, this whole thing and how much it could hurt people. And hopefully it won't, but yeah. Um, and down here at the box, they're like, there are a few roadblocks. HIPAA, the law that regulates medical privacy, isn't really clear on whether researchers can share voices. Um, yeah, should definitely be done with a lot of intention and carefulness. Uh, let's say you donate your voice to the project. Who does the voice belong to? The person who spoke. They allowed you use of a recording. Uh, what are we allowed to do with it? The things that they told you that you could do and no more. Uh, what are researchers allowed to do with it? Can it be commercialized? Ah, anyway. Uh, while other health data can be separated from patients' identity and used for researches, voices are often identifiable. It is almost impossible to make a voice non-identifiable without uh, changing it in uh, changing the signal in a way that's going to affect its utility for a project like this. Every institution has different rules on what can be shared, and that opens all sorts of ethical and legal questions a team of bioethicists will explore. Shouldn't you have done the ethics exploration before the funding? Anyway, this is the sort of thing where I'm like, hey, actually, maybe what's important is that we look at what's happening right now, actually happening, and don't spend a bunch of time and money and energy on pure hypotheticals. Anyway. <sighs> um... So this is another paper. It's very much in the sort of um, ethics realm uh, rather than the research realm. Uh, but the uh, the general thing here is that like, hey, there's lots of ways of defining fairness. And if you pick one, you're going to be violating another. So what do you do with that? Uh, and it's closed content, so I can't read it. But there you go. Uh, and it's just sort of a. Uh, general introduction to it. So if you have access, uh, maybe might be helpful. Uh, it's by Ben Green and it's in Philosophy and Technology. And it came out October 8th, 2022. All right. Uh, next up is, uh, I'll post this uh, in the chat, a little bit of a, uh, what would I call this? Spooky, uh, nice tech, seasonal spooky thing, uh, ghost work. Um, and it's just a, a page that I believe uh, sort of rounds up some different work and research on uh, the human labor that's used to, quote, conduct tasks such as data cleaning, coding, and classifying content. Uh, basically, we all know, uh, I should say the URL here is ghostwork.org. Uh, we all know that um, machine learning uh, often takes a lot of human labor. Um, in NLP, it requires human labor because someone produced that language in the first place. Uh, and yeah, what about those humans? What about the people who did the labor in the first place? So uh, just an interesting uh, uh, coverage of that. I think something that's important to, to think about. Um, 
I'm going to read another expert. Platform-based work is largely unseen. Workers are unable to speak with managers, do not get feedback, and lack labor productions. protection. Excuse me. How do these specific work inf conditions influence ghost workers' well-being? Not great. Not well. I'll tell you that. So, uh, nice seasonal read if you are interested. Uh, and this I thought was really interesting. So, uh, stability AI. Um, trains their model using a lot of uh, images covered by copyright, so specifically uh, stable diffusion. Um, but they have another music model, another model, which is for music called dance diffusion, which I am not you know, as familiar with, but I happened to run across somebody talking about it. Uh, and this is an excerpt from their uh, paper, I believe. So basically the point of this thread is like, hey, you stole a lot of people's work, visual artists' work, and they don't like that. Uh, and this expert says, uh, it's about dance diffusion, this music model. Dance diffusion is built on data sets composed entirely of copyright free and voluntarily provided music and audio samples in direct contrast to stable diffusion, which was trained on just like art they scraped. Because diffusion models are prone to memorization and overfitting, stable diffusion is also a diffusion model, uh, releasing a model trained on copyrighted data could potentially result in legal issues. And honoring the intellectual property of artists, some artists, while also complying to the best of their ability with the often strict copyright standards of the music industry, keeping any kind of copyrighted material out of the training data was a must. Um, so basically this person is just pointing out the double standard, like, hey, you're respecting musical artists, but you're certain who are usually backed by record labels, who are both well-funded and litigious, but you are not respecting visual artists in the same way. So, uh, no. Uh, Nine Gaming says, doesn't this apply to most of the gig workers, like Uber drivers, Uber Eats delivery partners? Yeah, no, I definitely would agree. Um, yep. Uh, same things apply, and I think it's important that we continue to consider them. Uh, speaking of which, so this is a slate piece from Future Tense uh, by Noah Gian Syracuse, I think. Um, G I A N S I R A C U S A, uh, and it's a title: "The Real Threat from AI Isn't Super Intelligence, It's Gullibility." Um, so I think it was just a nice think piece, and I'll pop this in the chat if anyone would like to read it. Uh, on basically, like, hey, the reasons that AI are gullible are that we the reason that AI is dangerous is that we just will trust them in situations where it doesn't make sense for us to trust them, um, and not you know AGI. So. Interesting, uh, you know, interesting discussion. Uh, talks about a lot of things we talk about on the channel. Uh, and it's from October 11th. Sorry, I didn't say the date. Uh, and then uh, we're going to end up with just the fun section. So uh, two things here that I thought were pretty funny. Um, so this is a quote tweet from at right Arthur, Arthur Holland, Mike, Michelle, possibly, um, on Twitter. And he is quote tweeting, uh, Balaji Srinivasan, I think, uh, eight B A L at B A L A J I S, uh, on October 8th. And the quote tweet reads, the self-driving car problem will be solved by roads built for self-driving cars. Um, and Arthur uh, quote tweeted this and his quote says, uh, I can't believe nobody thought of this before. So simple, so elegant, so many trillions of dollars to replace every road on the planet. Um, I think this is just very funny. Um, I would say that the self-driving car problem is cars. And if we just, you know, there are other better solutions that uh, would address, uh, you know, all of the issues uh, with non-self-driving cars, uh, and most of them involve no cars, not changing the roads. Uh, and uh, the final thing, this is the Daily Mail, which is, um, I would say, a UK tabloid, but it was on emoji, and uh, I thought it was interesting. Um, oh my god, it's from the fee, F-E-M-A-I-L section, so I guess when your, mm, you know, envelopes are made out of iron. <laughs> uh, and it is by Belinda Cleary for Daily Mail Australia, October 11th. Uh, and the headline is why nobody should be using the thumbs up emoji in 2022. And the 10 symbols only old people use have Gen Z rolling their eyes. Um, so I thought it was just funny because, um, and I have uh, scrolled down to show the symbols. Um, 
languages change. Uh, and this is a great example of language change where uh, the younger generation has a specific usage mode, the older generation has a different one. Uh, if you go up you know, even further, um, for example, uh, emoticons with uh, noses were very age graded. So something that older folks do, the younger folks didn't. Uh, and the 10 emojis are the thumb up, the monkey covering its eyes, the okay hand, uh, the sobbing face, the kissy lips, the red heart, the grimacing face, the black check mark, the clapping emoji, and the smiling poop emoji. So all things that have fallen out of use uh, with Zoomers uh, that millennials still use. So, uh, Robbie says, Python is three times greater than R. Can you guess how? I mean, Python is a general purpose programming language and R is a language for statistics. So m more people need to do general programming tasks than statistics, like that's, that's fine. Uh, more people use screwdrivers than, you know, jewelers tools as well. That's not an issue. It's just one of them is more specialized. All right. So that is all I had for you today. Uh, and I want to take a second to thank my wonderful coffee supporters who make this relevant, relevant, possible. Um, and I have not yet done the links for today. I'll, I'll get to them. They're almost done. Um, if you are interested in supporting me on coffee and making this possible, uh, my coffee is ko-fi.com slash R-C-T-A-T-M-A-N. So uh, thank you very much to everybody who supports me. I appreciate you. That's all I had for today. Uh, we'll be back next Tuesday with something. We'll see. Uh, it'll be fun. Uh, I'll talk to you then. And otherwise, have a great weekend. Uh, oh, thank you, episode Docking AI. It's great to see you, as always. Uh, yeah, so I'll talk to you later. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Bye.